I really believe that there's a huge amount of potential in human beings, but the problem is, is that because of these hierarchical dynamics that we are struggling to transcend, we wind up actually capping our potential. So this is like my total obsession, is what would it mean to get our real potential from human beings? This is what I think about all the time, okay? Now, the way that I want you to think about it is that in a tribal hierarchy, what winds up happening is that the person who's at the top of the hierarchy, their brain gives them more access to the full range of their knowledge, okay? And it also changes their subcommunication. So what's number one? Number one, when you feel that you're at the top of the hierarchy, your brain gives you full access to all of your knowledge. What happens is that when you don't feel high in the hierarchy, your brain actually shuts you down from the extent of your knowledge. So you can imagine if you walked up to somebody who you're very intimidated by, normally with a group of your friends that you're comfortable around, you can talk very, very easily. But if it's somebody who you're really into or somebody who you're intimidated by or somebody who you want something from or you care about their approval, you'll notice that you tend to shut down. You ever observe this in yourself? Well, when you take that basic phenomenon, extend that for a second into the realization that that's also happening just in your general thoughts in your head. So you probably have that amazing multi-million dollar business idea in your brain somewhere. You probably have that incredible creativity in your brain somewhere. But in the same way that if you go and talk to somebody who you're intimidated to, that becomes um, this thing that shuts down your ability to talk and talk and talk. In the exact same way, what winds up happening is that you... Uh, you get shut down equally in your own thoughts. So imagine that, you're not just being shut down when talking to somebody who you're into, you're being shut down even in your own thoughts. Okay, please let that land. Even in your own mind, that's being shut down. And you can tell what somebody's thought patterns are like, if they're very laser focused and strong, or if they're weak, you can actually sense that just by the way they speak. The way that somebody speaks is a manifestation of the quality of their thinking in many, many cases. I wouldn't say 100%, but very, very, very common. So when somebody speaks with clarity and conviction, they're very likely thinking with clarity and conviction. But if you're expressing with like, uh, yeah, like that, probably in your head, you're like, uh, yeah, just like that. So what happens is that in your mind, if you view yourself at higher in the hierarchy, you think that you're allowed to think with conviction. You think that you're allowed to, to be creative. You think that you're allowed to have a broad range of thinking. Again, these are generalizations, it's not 100%, but you can sort of get the gist of what it is that I'm saying. Now, also what changes is your communication. So, when you feel low in the hierarchy, what winds up happening is that your voice tightens up and you'll also change different facial expressions and you'll also uh, change uh, vocal projection, vocal pitch, cadence, all of these different things. All of this stuff is going to change when you view yourself as low status. And as a result, less people are going to listen to you. And because less people are listening to you, then what winds up happening is it further reinforces that sense of having low status. So what I try to actually teach people is less along the lines of you have to make more money or you, know, you have to say hit the gym to have higher status. I think these are things that have value independently of what it is that I'm teaching. A lot of people struggle with that because when I teach how to make these mental shifts and I say you don't need to be better looking, you don't need to make more money, people twist what it is that I'm saying and then they say, oh, you're saying that having money is bad or going to the gym is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that these are separate areas of study and you want to understand them as discrete and separate areas to study. The reason why I say this is because if you're dependent on looks or money in order to feel status, what winds up happening is that, you know, say that you got in a car accident and you got out of shape, your confidence would go down. Say that you went into a bad economy and you lost money, your confidence would go down. So you want your confidence to be like a rock. You don't want it to be dependent on anything external. Counter argument, by the way, what's the counter argument? Counter argument to that is, um, well, why should you feel confident if you haven't accomplished anything? You know, that feeling that your life sucks is actually put there to drive you. That's true. Now, counter argument to that. Well, if your brain is shut down and you're not loose and fluid and you're communicating poorly, then you're also stifled and stuck. So that's why I recommend to fix this at a base core level. Now, the way that I want you to understand it is that people are judging you based on their RAS. Say the word RAS. RAS. So that is reticular, reticular, reticular activation, activation system. system. Okay, reticular activation system. So what's happening is that we have selective focus. And our focus is so utterly selective 
that you could barely get people in the most prosperous country in the world to get along with each other. People in relationships see things differently. People in business partnerships see things differently. There was an old Japanese movie, I think it was called Roshimon or something like that, where, where there was like this court episode that showed all four different people's, or I think it was, I saw this years and years ago, decades ago, but it showed all the different people's um, way of perceiving a series of events. It shows that. And what was crazy about it was that everybody's view was different, and then, and then in the end, it showed what actually happened, and it showed how everybody selectively saw things differently, okay? So what you're gonna realize is that when you come across as confident, people's RAS is gonna warp and twist to see you in a favorable light. Their halo effect is gonna get, they're gonna put a halo effect onto you, and they're gonna see you in a more favorable light. So this is why you have to understand that you do not want to be just focused on objectively meeting certain people's standards. Okay? This is, please, please, you, you got to really come out of the trance. You got to really let this land, okay? What most of you are doing is you're looking at society's standards and you're saying to yourself, how do I reach society's standards? And then if I reach society's standards, then I can feel confident. Then if I could feel confident, then I could be in an upward spiral. So what we do is we look at what um, you know, media and advertising is telling us that good looking people should look like, what they should wear, how they should act, what standards they should live up to. We look at that and then we try to live up to that. And then we think that if we could live up to that, then we'd be confident and then things would shoot up and up and up and up and up. What we want to do instead is we want to still look at society's standards as some general guidelines for how to harmonize the society, right? I mean, say making a lot of money is something that has a value on it in society for a reason, right? Because having more money gives you more freedom, it gives you more options, it gives you more safety, and so on and so forth, right? So obviously having money is very, very cool. That doesn't mean we need to be contrarians and say don't make money because I'm this like wizard of mental you know, mastery or something like that, right? You know, so you know, for me, I've been attached to over $100 million in sales. Obviously, I care about having money. I'm not saying otherwise. But what I'm telling you is that when I go into a social situation, money does not come up. And if it does, and I let it slip by accident, usually what winds up happening is it comes across as self-qualifying. Say that word, self-qualifying. Self yeah, so in other words, um, one, of the, one of the worst things about, say, having a Lamborghini when you're out at the club and you're meeting people, talking to people, is you'll find that you, want, you have this instinct to draw them back to see it. Imagine you had a Lambo right now that you went out tonight. Wouldn't you want to kind of just keep trying to bring people back to see the Lambo as if that would do something? So it puts you in this self-qualifying mode where you just keep wanting to self-qualify. But that is the opposite of what gets people to have that RES flip and halo effect in your favor. Okay, it's the exact opposite of that. Because any time that you come across as what's called self-qualifying in any way, shape, or form, it's actually lowering your social value. You want to be doing the opposite of self-qualification. You never want to look as though you're qualifying yourself to the other person. Rather, you want to just be expressing, and then you want it to where they want to begin self-qualifying to you. So you've got to be very, very aware of this and very, very careful about it, okay? Super duper 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 important. Now, going from there, once we understand this, Let's look at some of the shifts that happen, okay? So when you feel confident, when you feel good, like I'm at the top of the hierarchy or whatever, or, or high enough in it. But by the way, I'm gonna show you how to transcend all this. Really, you should remove the hierarchy out of it completely. So I'm gonna show it to you at a base level, but then I'm gonna show you how to remove the whole thing, okay? To completely transcend the whole stupid dynamic, okay? This is really where humanity would benefit from going in my view, strong view. So basically what happens is imagine right now <clears throat> if you had all the money in the world, Imagine if you were throwing a party and you were the main person who was the host of that party. Imagine if you had all these attractive people trying to mess around and hook up with you. Imagine if your phone was ringing off the hook with celebrities and, and, and rich people and cool people and attractive people and friends all trying to get your attention. Imagine if you're basically just unstoppable. Every, everything is just going for you in your favor. How would you feel in your brain? Okay, go into your mind right now and imagine how that would feel. Okay, just allow yourself to go in your brain and imagine how that would feel, okay? Let yourself do that. So as you're imagining how that would feel, what you're gonna notice is that you're thinking less. You're thinking less, and you're constraining yourself less, and you're expressing more freely, because you assume that people wanna hear what you have to say. You assume that what you have to say is funny. You assume that any silly thing that you say, people are gonna eat it up. You have that assumption. 
This is why what often creates a better impression is less about saying the perfect thing and it's more about free, associate, free association, it's more about free expression, it's more about not filtering yourself, and it's more about believing in what it is that you have to say. So this shift is what really changes that status dynamic. If you can shift that status dynamic, what you're gonna see is more and more people are gonna like you, and then ironically, as more and more people like you, you don't need to self-brainwash as much because you actually have real legs on the table, you know, so because somewhere in the chain you have to kind of, you, you, th there's basically this chain of what's going on with you and you've got to attack it somewhere, right? So th the way the chain works, which we've talked about already, is that you have your belief system, like what you think of yourself, how you'd rank yourself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have what it is that you would focus on, right? What you tend to be focusing on in situations. Then you have, do yeah, anyone remember the next one? how it changes your physiology, in other words, the way you express yourself, then it creates self-fulfilling prophecy, then it, you have to interpret those experiences, and then that further reinforces your beliefs. So we've got to attack this little cycle somewhere, okay? Somewhere in there we've got to attack it. So we can attack it at the level of beliefs by examining your beliefs, we can attack it at looking at what it is that you're focusing on, we can attack it at looking at the way that you carry yourself, we can attack it at using that to create self-fulfilling prophecies, and we can attack it at the level of interpretation of those prophecies, and then we can go back and attack it at the level of beliefs. But we've got to, we, we basically want to be attacking it at all, all the different directions. <clears throat> okay, every little spot you want to be attacking it. So by attacking it, I just mean looking at the right way to do it and then implementing that. That's how you create real transformation. But there's many ways to create real transformation, but that's a huge one. So what you'll notice is that if you had that really high sense of belief, imagine that your beliefs are amazing, right? Imagine that your belief, let's look at that chain. Imagine that your beliefs are amazing. Well, if your beliefs about yourself are amazing, then what would happen is then you'd be focusing on good things in yourself. Your focus would be on the positive in yourself. Then what would happen is your communication would change. You'd start expressing more freely, you'd just say whatever comes to mind, and your jokes would be funnier, everything would just be better. Then what would happen is more people would like you, then if you're interpreting, because by the way, a lot of people have a lot of people who like them, but they don't interpret it that way. You ever seen that? They don't interpret it that way. They interpret it like, like everybody's loving them, but they don't interpret it that way. You ever have a significant other who you love to death, but they keep saying that you don't love them? You ever have that? Right? And you're like, I've given you my soul. You, lit you, you, have, you, you, you actually have my entire soul. <laughs> yeah, but do you love me? I, I opened my head reached in, pulled my soul out, and gave it to you. Yeah, but you don't love me, right? Because, it's, because there's, there's a problem in the beliefs, right? We don't, we don't believe what we see, we see what we believe. Okay, say that with me. We don't believe what we see, we don't believe what we see, we, don't believe what we, see. we see what we believe. If you think that you're unlovable, you know, you could have a significant other that gave you the world. The entire world and their soul doesn't matter because you think that you're unlovable. So you'll keep going back to that again and again and again. But do you really love me? Is this real love? Doesn't matter because they believe that. Same thing with getting better socially. Yeah, but every, everybody liked you tonight. But was it actually good? I've had trainings that I've done where someone goes out, they're killing it, but they can't believe it's real. Bro, you're doing amazing. But really? They can't believe it. It's not real to them because they have a limiting belief. They, they don't feel worthy of love, et cetera, et cetera. And then what they do is they overly focus on any negative response. So you could have it to where somebody goes out, they have 10 interactions, one of them is good and nine are bad, but if they have a high self-belief, they're gonna focus on the good one. If they focus on the good one, they're gonna rehearse that in their mind. If they rehearse that in their mind, then what winds up happening is they wind up acting like that more because they're looping that in their mind, okay? But on the other hand, if you're focusing on the nine bad ones, then you're mentally rehearsing that because you're mentally replaying it again and again and again. So what happens from that standpoint as you're mentally replaying it again and again and again is that you begin to act like that. Now, conversely, I've seen people that have nine great interactions and one bad one. But what happens there, same thing. They start rehearsing the one bad one looping on the one bad one again and again and again. And so what happens now is they become that. So you gotta get it to where you're focused on the good ones, you're learning from the bad ones, but you're focused on the good ones. And this begins to affect that kinetic chain that we're talking about here. 
So understanding from that standpoint, then what begins to shift? OK, so I'm going to put this in pragmatic terms. If you have the perfect joke, that is probably less effective than believing in a bad joke. If you have the perfect thing to say, that is less effective than believing in the less than perfect thing to say. Did everybody here get this? OK, so I could recite the perfect, perfect, perfect joke. But if I don't believe in it, it's going to fall flat. If I believe that something that is dumb is funny, like if I'm just like literally playing with this pen and I'm like, and I'm just, I believe that the pen is funny, then you guys will laugh at that, even though the joke is like a one out of 10 joke. I'm just like, you guys will laugh at that, right? Because if I, if I can get myself to believe in it. But the problem is, is that if you try to imitate that, here's what will happen. I'm not done. What will happen is you try to imitate the pen joke, and then you're like, and you're trying to imitate it because you're trying to live up to my standard. You're like, oh, I'm going to do the pen joke like what Owen did. So you try to do that, and it's ineffective. So, so the way that humor works is that it's very, very thoughtless. Like you're just not thinking that much. You're barely thinking at all, and you're just expressing, and you're expressing without a filter. Say the word barely thinking. Barely thinking. Expressing without filter. Expressing without filter. Okay, expressing without self doubt. Expressing without self doubt. Now, there's always a balance to this. There's always social awareness. There's always social calibration. So be aware that that can also blow up in your face very, very quickly because some people so severely lack in social awareness that they go too far down that. Th that path, okay? So right now I'm focusing a little bit more on the self-belief. I'll tell you this though, as you begin to believe in yourself more and more, what you're also going to notice is that as you believe in yourself more and more and more, you will free up mental bandwidth. Say the word free up mental bandwidth. Free up mental you're bandwidth. You're going to free up mental bandwidth to become socially aware. Okay? You're, you're gonna become more socially aware because your mental bandwidth has been freed up. So this is a major, major thing is that over time, you can actually develop social awareness because of the fact that you're not so trapped in your head. See, people that are low status often struggle with social awareness and they struggle with it because of the fact that their mind is so caught up in thinking what people think of them. So you, you can kind of get bad social awareness from two different standpoints. One of them is you get it because um, you're too selfish, okay? You have too much self-belief, in which case you get out of balance, or conversely, you, uh, you're, you actually care too much. You see this? What happens if you care too much? You're always analyzing everybody's responses. Okay, you're analyzing everybody's responses again and again and again and again. But then if you care too, if you care too little, then you also can become a weird freak. So you've got, to, you've got to start to get it from both sides is the way that you want to be thinking about it. Okay, both sides of the coin is what you have to do. Okay, but we're not going to focus as much on social calibration today. I want to focus more on the status components. Now, as far as the status components, there's basic sort of inroads that we can take that allow you to begin to shift this. So let's talk about the different inroads that you could take, okay? One of them is looking at empowering beliefs. That could be believing in things like abundance. There's an abundance of people who you could meet. It could be focusing on the more positive things in yourself and the value that you're adding. It could be just straight brainwashing yourself that you're a 10 because you know that if you brainwash yourself that you're a 10, you became a 10. It could be that. Now, I have personally experienced that this works moderately well. Moderately well. So here's what I mean by this. Um, you can brainwash yourself to a point, but there is going to be that point where your mind can detect some dissonance. It's just like, I'm a 10, I'm a 10, I'm a 10. But over time, your brain's just like, you're not, so why do you keep saying this? Nonetheless, I think that there is some advantages to just lying to yourself, just saying, I'm a 10. Because the lie becomes real in many ways. Like, the more that you do that, the more that you kind of start to carry yourself like that. So it's sort of like a weak structural integrity, but that probably strengthens the structure to an extent. Okay, just brain, self brainwashing. Like, what if as an experiment today, you just said, I'm a 10. 10! And you just put that in your head. How would you act? How would that change you? I'm a 10! That's me! What if you just brainwash yourself like that? I'm the best. Anybody would be lucky to hang out with me. I'm the, I am the coolest person here. 
Anybody would be lucky to hang out with me. I'm having the most fun. The most fun is right here. This is amazing. Everything I say is amazing. Everything I say is a gift. What if you just did that? Okay, just saying that. I'm seeing some of you smiling. Just me saying that, you start smiling, right? So that is one component of what can help you. Straight belief system. Or how about another belief system? Instead of saying, I'm the man, you say, there's billions of people in the world. Some of them are going to get me. There's billions of us. Some of them are going to get it. I don't need to worry if I'm a 10. I just have to find those people who get me. That's another way that you could do it. So there's many, many different ways that you could go with this. Okay? You know, another, another way that you could do it is in, with a spiritual connection and viewing it from a spiritual point of view. There's many different ways that you can attack the beliefs. Now again, let's look at the focus. What are you focusing on in yourself? You're going to have positive qualities. You're going to have negative qualities. So are you focusing on the positive or the negative? Where's your mind going? A lot of people focus on the negative in themselves. So you want to focus on the positive. You can work on the negative, but focus on the positive. Now, another one would be your physiology. And that would be manually understanding vocal projection, cadence, pitch, tone, eye contact, all the body language components, things like frame control. And so you can begin to get that stuff. Then you go get self-fulfilling prophecies from that. You're going to get your response. But then you look at the interpretation. If you had 10 interactions, five went well, five went bad. Are you focused on the five good ones or are you focused on the five bad ones? And then you focus on that. So from that standpoint, you could actually come into a very, very empowered place. Okay? Because then what you're focusing on reinforces your beliefs. So you want to be thinking of this like attacking it at each angle, but you've also got to start to realize what it looks like to be socially free, what it looks like to be unstifled, and how this generates the RAS flip. So as long as you are consistently trying to live up to the standards of society and you're making that the main way that you decide how you feel in your own body, as long as you're consistently trying to do that, you're never going to actually get confidence. It's never going to work because the standard is going to keep changing and then there's going to be better people. And look, let me put it to you this way. Like I live in a fat crib in LA, but if I just say, oh, I'm confident because I have a fat crib in LA, there's people in Los Angeles that have cribs that are worth a hundred times my crib. So see, you would see the fat crib that I have in LA. And you'd say, well, if I had that crib, I'd be confident. But the thing is, then you find out that the people that you're inviting up have been to way, way, way better places. Okay, what if I spent the next three years getting in the best shape that I could? The next three years. With my genetics and my body type, look, I could definitely get in really nice shape. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying it. But like, I've trained before. I trained for over a decade. Did I ever look that great? I trained for, for about 15 years. I never got it. Like, now, some people would say, oh, it's in the training, whatever. I was in there four days a week pounding weights, sometimes five pounding weights. I was taking enough protein. I was keeping body fat levels for anywhere from uh, 6% to like 13% and oscillating. I was doing all of that stuff. But even as I did that, there's always going to be people that just have better genetics than me. There's always there's going to be a lot of people at the gym that are on steroids. A lot of people don't know that. Most of, not, maybe not most, but a lot of the people that you see at the gym that you don't think are on steroids because they're not, they're not even that, in that great of shape, just to even maintain the not that great of shape, like, like very, very good shape, but like it's not like amazing. It's just really, really good. They're on light levels of steroids or different replacement of, of hormones and things like that. Maybe you chose to do that because you just want to do that. That's fine, but I'm just making the point that like that is a lot of what's going on. Like a lot of, a lot of what you see is just like, you know, a typical guy who just is like in, like he's just kind of Jack, like that guy has done some steroids. So do you want to do that? That's up to you. I personally don't. I didn't really see the value in it. I didn't see the value in it because I never met somebody who was better in a nightclub environment than me who was taking steroids. 
I just never ever saw that. I never saw somebody who got better results. I never saw somebody who got better responses. So I didn't see the purpose in doing that. I suppose that if, that if it was just this, like I think a lot of people that focus more on the money or the, or the steroid type mentality, I think they literally believe that when you go out, you just kind of walk up to someone and they just like look you over and try to figure out how much cash you have and then they just decide on you. I think that's generally, like I think they're very much at the effect and so they think that that's what that is. Now, by the way, at the highest level of understanding communication, um, really none of this stuff matters at all. But at the same time, if you're somebody who's kind of a little bit in between, you can still handle your appearance to whatever degree. Don't get me wrong. You don't need to make it harder on yourself, okay? So for example, if you're not very good socially, you have, you have poor beliefs, you, put, you focus on things negative about yourself, your physiology and your body language, all that is off. Well then, why make it harder on yourself by not fixing things. So, you know, go ahead and fix things or continue to work on your appearance. Go ahead and do that. Just realize that's not going to be the cure-all. As long as you understand that it's not the cure-all, then you're going to be good. Okay? So, I am I'm somebody who's very, very results-oriented. I personally try to be as objective as humanly possible. I try everything and I consistently challenge my own beliefs and I try to make myself wrong. And so what I found over the years, and again, I've been going out for two decades now, what I found over the years was that what really, really works when I go out is basically I just don't give a F, okay? I don't give a F. I'm having the most fun of everybody there. I'm the least self-monitoring and self-filtering of anybody there. And I'm the most outside my head of anybody there. So this is really, really what you want to be emphasizing is getting outside of your head, getting into a flow state, joking around, having fun, and then looking at your communication and the different subcommunication that's going on. And then from there, putting together a solid social media profile because that's gonna be your follow-up. That includes your grid and that includes your stories. And having a really, really good place to invite people to and having cool, fun things to invite people to. This is what I found to be like the big, 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 big wins as far as all of this, okay? And what starts to happen when you do this is it becomes this tremendous upward spiral. You'll go out and you'll be having so much fun you're gonna feel like you're high. Then what's gonna happen is you're gonna be the most present you've ever felt in your freaking life. You're gonna also have no trouble coming up with things to say at all. You're gonna be vibing and vibing and vibing and everybody's gonna be having so much fun. People are gonna be generally eating up what it is that you have to say, and yet you're thinking less about what it is that you're saying. You're thinking less, and the less that you think about it, the more that you're gonna see them to be very, very drawn in to what it is that you're doing. And then what's gonna start happening is you're gonna start amusing yourself. Okay, say the word self-amusement. Self okay, and you're gonna start amusing yourself tremendously. As you're tr amusing yourself tremendously, what's then gonna wind up happening is other people are gonna get drawn into that, which makes it even more funny. Okay, and then you're gonna see people getting really, really into you, which is gonna reinforce your frame. Then what you're gonna see happening is you're gonna bounce around the venue and everybody's gonna be having incredible, incredible fun with you. And that's gonna further cause you to get more out of your head. And it's gonna cause you to further believe in what it is that you have to say. And then it's gonna set off that chain in motion. And then what happens is that you become the opposite of creepy because creepy is when you're trying to take something. But the opposite of creepy is when you're looking to give something. And what begins to happen is that you start to feel so good in your own body, you start to feel so self-validated that what winds up happening is that you're putting out so many good vibes that people feel this sort of buyer-seller dynamic to where they wanna be a part of your vibe. And they feel this energetically. It's an energetic shift that people tangibly feel. And it's this weird, weird thing where even if you're less attractive, but they feel that the energy is with you, they will often begin to doubt their own attractiveness and they will begin to have an RAS flip and buy into your attractiveness. And this is why, by the way, when you get into a relationship, you can kill that over time because if you start to lose that flow, and then what happens is that you start to invest your happiness and confidence into the other person, they feel that shift in the kind of sun versus black hole dynamic, right? The sun versus black hole dynamic, and you begin to become the black hole. Then they have a counter RAS flip, and then they demonize you. And who here has ever experienced that? Where like literally your significant other literally demonizes you after you broke up. Who Put your hand way up if you've ever had that. 
put your head way up. Isn't that a bizarre experience? That's a very, very bizarre experience. That can also be borderline personality disorder, by the way. It's actually quite common. You should look that up. Very, very common. It's called a uh, discard. But the point is it can also happen in non-BPD cases where the dynamic got flipped, right? Now, ironically, the very person who you're dating can be always encouraging you, don't go out, baby. Don't go to the gym, baby. Don't do your passions, baby. Just cuddle with me, with me, with me. So then you do all that and you listen, then you lose your confidence, then that dynamic shifts, and then they leave you. <laughs> and, that, and that's like a very, very common thing to have happen, actually. It's incredibly common. It's uh, shocking how common that is. And so, you know, some people joke that men do this like pump and dump thing. Well, in the opposite case, I call it chump and dump. Okay, you get chumped and dumped. You, get, you, you, you buy into the easy emotions and the validation. So it goes from when you met them, when you met them, you were in this upward spiral and you were the sun giving out the energy and then everyone's drawn towards you. But then later you get lazy because you're doing too much Netflix and just you know, eating ice cream and Netflix with them. And then all of a sudden you have nothing else going on in your life and then you become the black hole and they become the sun and then they have a reverse RAS flip and it literally is not that different. Like you could have been with somebody for like three, four years and literally, just like when you're in the club and you act a little bit creepy, and they're just like, get away from me, ooh, 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 get away. Somebody who you're with for three or four years has the RAS flip, ooh, 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 get away from me. They take all the events of the past three or four years, completely warp them for the negative, because it's biological, right? It's, it's biological saying, don't mess around with this person. Don't, give, don't invest further in this person. So their biology hijacks the brain, does a reverse RAS flip to get away from you to make sure that they don't either reproduce with you or they don't get involved with you. And they have a reverse RAS flip. And then at that point, what starts to happen is that you feel that happening and then you start doing what when you feel that happening? What's the thing that I told you to start not to do? You got the gist of it, investing more. Ch say the word self-qualification. Self yeah, so you start to self-qualify constantly, and then in that act of self-qualification, they see that, and then they get further and further turned off. And by the way, you could be, this could literally be somebody who is um, highly educated, highly intelligent, extremely rational, even watch other people do that to you, and then condemn them, like, how could someone do that when you did so much for them? But the biology there is so strong that if you become the needy one, they can flip, completely repaint and reorient the entire series of events that happen. There's no what's called object constancy. Say the word object constancy. Object constancy. Okay, so they're not able to retain you objectively as, a, as like who and what you are in the mind. They go and reframe every situation for the negative and for the bad, fully demonize you, and only when you're completely ejected from their lives and maybe they've like had another relationship and then that went to crap, then they'll see you more as a friend, like two or three years later or a year later, whatever it takes. And then they remember it more objectively at that point. Then they go back to remember it. They're like, oh, we did this. That was fun. Didn't pan out, but you know, it was really cool. I'm sorry for what I said. I was hurt, yada, yada. But then they'll still think that was your fault too. <laughs> but they'll just say that. And the reason why that is, and it doesn't matter what you did. I mean, I could give you examples. Like, it doesn't matter what you did. Like, you could have, like, given your soul. Doesn't matter. Why is that? because there's no object constancy. They can't, they're not able to just retain who you are in their mind or the series of events because of that shift in the energetic dynamic to where you became the black hole, they became the sun and it flips. So understand that in any situation that you're in, that is always an ongoing dynamic. It doesn't matter if that person's your soulmate. It doesn't matter who it is. That will be the ongoing dynamic forever. It's always like that. So if you give up that, so you, you should view it that if you give up that dynamic that you're cheating on your partner. That's the shift in thinking that you have to think about, okay? View it that if you fail in that dynamic, you are basically cheating on your partner. Can you guys think of it that way? Yeah. Okay, because in effect, what you're, what you're causing is the same problems. So you have to view it like it's, it's a must, not a should to be able to do that. Yep. Um, what do you do to avoid that? Kind of answered it just now, but what do you do to You want to stay focused on your passions, your hobbies. Even when they say, Netflix and chill with me, baby, ice cream with me, and all that, you can do a little bit of that. You don't need to be like, you know, like that. There's a balance, right? I think that if you don't do that enough, it's also bad. But it's got to be a mix. And it's one of those things where you'll see it. Like, you'll watch where when you're on the up and up, everybody loves you because you are the sun and everybody's enjoying you. But when you go down, you will watch as people will leave like rats fleeing a sinking ship. You will see that, and you will see who your real friends are and who they aren't. 
and there'll be a very, very small number of people who genuinely, genuinely believe in you as a person and genuinely connect with you as a person and, they're, and they have enough object constancy to see beyond you know, the moment when you're down for a minute because we've had many ups and downs over the years and, and we've had big, big highs that you guys have seen and we've had lows that you guys have seen and you'll consistently see it on the highs. Everybody wants to be part of it. Everybody's your best friend. Everybody loves you. They, they, they profess their love. They tell you how great you are. They will say things like, like in relationships, you'll hear things like, I love you. You're my soulmate. I see visions of us being together. Like they're, they're literally like hallucinating your future together. Saying things like, you know, if we were to break up, I would just rather become a nun than ever see anyone but you. Like da da da. And you'll see that. But then if that dynamic reverses, it becomes like, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you never loved, like a big one is like, you never love me. Like totally insane, insane, insane. Like so far past anything conceivable, you can't, you can't even try to put your head around it. You didn't, you, because the you never love me is what? It's the justification to leave. But so they never love me, <laughs> right? Bye. Oh, you know, I just realized you never love me. You know, by coincidence, when you're going down, right? It didn't happen when you're on the peak, right? It happened when you're going down. So it's one of these things where, You've got to become aware of the dynamic that you're entrenched in, okay? You've got to become aware of that. And the way that you want to think about it is that you don't want to just skip that dynamic completely and opt out of it because that's a loser's frame, right? Because I bet you a lot of you right now are thinking like, well, that's what it is. If that's how this is, I just want nothing to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. You're probably thinking a little bit like that. Don't think of it like that. Rather think about it that you're a competent person who can manage these different variables. None of this stuff is rocket science. You can absolutely do this. Okay, you can absolutely get this down. And then from there, what I would say would be realize to keep a tight circle. Like realize, like you've got to get a, you've got to look at people's behavior and see if they're the kind of people that leave when the chips are down. You've got to see if they're the kind of people who, um, like, if you guys look at me, right, you guys remember when Julian's issue happened, right? How many bosses in that situation would have stuck in there? How many have you ever seen in your life? When have you ever in your life seen the boss not disassociate when something like that happens? Did you guys remember that in 2014? Right? Well, why am I able to do that? I have a strong sense of object constancy. I'm like, I understand who this person is. I understand that's not in my character to do that. So I'm not gonna do that. I understand in retrospect, I actually wish that I would've just said that he was fired because I think the problem would've just gone away. <laughs> but the point is, I just wish I just would've said it. <laughs> but the point being is that, um, it would've been better for him, I think. But the point being, um, if I would've just said that. But the point being is like, I have object constantly. So for me, if I like somebody and I believe in them, like an example for me, for me would be like, whenever I have an ex-girlfriend, I never love them any less at all, never. I love every ex-girlfriend I have no different than the day that we broke up, Z zero. Okay, why is that? I have object constancy, right? I can recognize, okay, well, it didn't pan out. We didn't, we didn't get along to the point that it would make sense to stay together. So, you know, there were some structural issues in the relationship itself, maybe different priorities or going in different directions, lack of alignment, but I still recognize the good qualities that I loved in the person and that they're, I still think that they're hot. I still think that they're, you know, sexy, I still think they're amazing. I still love all those same things about them. Even if they got mad at me, I don't really care because I just view it that their mind doesn't have that object constancy. So their brain's not, their brain is not, um, there's not enough uh, sort of like gravity in the mind, like holding it all together, that allows them to keep a objective sense of what happened. But I also love them the exact same. I'm not gonna be a pest and be like, bugging them about it or anything like that. You know, I just move on. But the point being is that if I was being honest, that's how I feel. Now, if, I, if you want to know how I really feel, I evolve and I become a different person every couple of years. So then the way that, the way that I think about it is like, oh, like, you know, the 30-year-old version of Owen, that guy loves that girl. I'm a different person now, so I wouldn't necessarily want to go back. You know, I evolve, I change. And frankly, if you don't grow together, then that is what it is. But I kind of think that, I kind of think the same of everybody who I ever met that I liked, I still think they're cool and I still root for them and I still try to help them out. Even people that did me dirty, like did really, really bad stuff to me, horrible, horrible betrayals. And also go help them because I'm like, well, 
I still can recognize that's not who the person is. I can recognize that their RAS got hijacked by their biology and that I'm lucky that my RAS does not as easily get hijacked by my, bi my biology. I probably had only two or three cases in my whole life where someone just stabbed me in the back so friggin' hard that I could feel myself having an RAS flip and like wiping them out of my memory. I could feel that happening. And then within about three, and, and what happens though is that when I do that, it's so utterly toxic, like I, it feels so poisonous in my system that I literally will sit there and I'll become their advocate in my mind for like a month and try to understand what their perspective was and like literally make myself go on their team, love them, continue to love them and accept them, even apologize to them and then I just forget about them and I, or not forget about them, but I just kind of like realize that it's done and then I just move on. Because I don't like I, I don't like that RES flip thing towards other people. Like in my mind, if you're the kind of person where like you just have an RES flip towards somebody when like you're not continuing to get what you want, maybe they had a down moment. That is so animalistic in this form of consciousness. How do you separate yourself from like the cow that you just ate? You know what I'm saying? Like I just had a steak. How am I any different from the steak from the cow that I just ate if I'm just completely run by biology and I'm just completely run by like, you know, my RAS flips and stuff like that, right? So for me, anytime that I feel myself doing that, if I fall into that, I'll stay there for two, three weeks, maybe a month, and I'll literally just like fight my way out of it. Just like, I'll literally be like, why did they do that? What made them feel the need to do that? What happened there? And usually what it comes down to, if I'm being honest, if you guys want to really know, what it always comes down to is a combination of two things. One is it's going to be stuff that you actually did wrong because you will have done stuff wrong and that'll be real. But you want to know the other thing that was really what happened for being real? It's that first thing that I said. It's that shift in the status dynamic. And you want to know why that is? Because if you had all that status, you could have done things wrong and they would have stayed. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's sort of a weird combo in A, recognizing that you did things that are wrong and recognizing that you wish to improve. But the other flip side of it is like, if you would have retained your value, it's very unlikely that they would have had the RAS flip, right? So it's this kind of thing. So, Understand that getting good at meeting people socially and in a club and the process and the journey that you go through there is also something that you maintain in lifelong relationships. So you're learning the process when you go out of how to jumpstart and kickstart that, but then you wind up also maintaining that in lifelong relationships. So what will generally happen for most people learning this content is that you're coming from a very, very low place. And then what'll happen is you'll go out and you'll bring better people into your life. Then what'll happen is you'll lose that, you'll lose the exact habits that it was that got you to bring those people into your life. You'll fall off. They will have an RAS flip. They will leave and you will be left in shock. And you'll pretend, and here's the main reason you'll be left in shock. You will be left in shock because you never wanted to do any of this in the first place. You never wanted to actually have to transform. You didn't want to have to actually put in the work and you were literally just doing it to get the result. Now for a hot minute, you got into the flow state and you got in the process and you started genuinely enjoying it, right? But then you get the person or you get the people in your life that you want, then you stop maintaining those habits that you never want to have to do in the first place, then you lose them and now you feel like you're starting over. You're like, wow, now I have to start over this whole freaking process. This is so frustrating. I don't want to have to go out again. And even things like gym, which again, you don't need to do or making money you don't need to do, I still recommend that you do them. Does that make sense? Like it's not, like going to the gym is not about reaching some objective body type to where you're like, oh, now I've hit this exact arm size so therefore I can attract people or things like that. It's about the pride that you get from actually hitting the gym. Like in my case, for example, if I'm local and I'm consistently um, in the same place quite a bit, I'll hit the gym. Now, the past three years, I just travel, 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 travel. And it's very, very, I was in nature almost the entire time. Hard to hit a gym. I don't care if I get out of shape if I'm traveling the entire country by car and in the middle of the mountains in Montana. I don't need that to look at like, you know, a, mo a mountain goat or something like that, right? I don't need to do that. But, you know, because in that case, I'm in momentum doing other things. But if I'm at home, then I feel like being at home, being in the gym is something that I actually enjoy and it builds my self-confidence. Whereas if I was away from home and it's like now I have to like drive from the middle of a national park two hours to Bozeman to go get to a gym because I'm afraid that I'm going to lose half an inch off my arms. To me, that's low self-esteem. You guys see the difference? Although I've been learning about some fitness companies that have elastics, so I might start doing that. Um, there's one called High Gear that I've been talking to them. Yep.
you ever work out in the forest or in nature? Well, yeah, you could do like calisthenics or things like that. I think that in my case, I was just shooting so many videos and doing so many hikes and stuff. So I was hiking and shooting and yeah, I was skiing, you know, stuff like that. But I think that could be good too. And also, again, these elastic band ones I'm learning about, that could be a cool one too. But, you know, that's just the, the, the specifics, but let's focus on the general principles here. So, quick thing. Yeah, quick. Yeah, loud and quick. because I have to get creative. I'm starting from scratch. And I yep. find that when I get to a really high level, there's a subconscious like, need to sabotage it. And so communicating boundaries in those defining moments in the context of a relationship can sometimes be those moments that you either fuck it up or you like you actually demonstrate the who you are. Yeah, it's it's also that, um, that it's sense? yeah, it's it's also very, very tricky because if somebody believes that you're gonna escalate past where they're at. They're going to they're gonna have this habit of consistently trying to take you off of your upward, of, of your upward ascension. So that's also kind of a challenge, right? And you'll see they'll do that, like, like they'll often do that, like, right when you, like, th there's a lot of emotional regulation that can go on between partners to where, like, you know that if you could just take that beautiful vacation and just love that vacation for a couple days, you get back to work and you'd be so fresh and so re recharged that you would kill it. But then because the person that you're with has abandonment fear, they might do things to try to make it where it not only doesn't recharge you, but it actually depletes you. You actually come back from the vacation depleted because you had friction. And then as a result, then you do worse at work, but then they feel like you won't abandon them, right? This is why you want to also bring people in your life that are very, very, very secure with themselves because they don't feel like you're going to abandon them, okay? This is like a really, really big thing that I've seen. So what I'm trying to show you here is I'm trying to show you the lay of the land from the beginning of learning this content towards the tail end of learning this content. And what you're gonna see over and over is that you're gonna go on this big upward run, then you're gonna have a lot of people really, really, really into you, then at some point you're gonna get lazy with it and lose the habits that got you there in the first place, then you're gonna go down and you're gonna see this huge shedding of people, even the closest people in your life, people that are so close, People that you've done so much for, people that you've sacrificed so much for, it won't matter, they're gonna shed out of your life. And, and it'll, it'll shock you. And, and it will shock you, and it will make it where you don't even feel the will to go on. Like you're like, I gave so much, I, I poured so much into this, how could this have been that? You just can't believe it. And it gets to the point where you're so, you're, you're, you're so sickened by humanity when you see this, that you don't wanna live on this world. You're like, I just don't even wanna live here. Like, like I don't know what this place is, I hate this place. I don't know why people do this, this sucks. And what I would say to you is first of all, look at where you're, and, and by the way, the exact people that are like, I would never do that, 98% would do it, okay? So very, very few people have the object constancy in the mind to remember the full breadth of an entire friendship, romantic relationship, business partnership, you know, working together in any capacity. The average person can't remember the full picture. They just can't. They're not able to have the object constancy to make it to where they're like, okay, I can remember the full thing that happened or the full amount of what that person is. They just don't have it. They, they're literally, pri they're prisoner of the moment because their biology is hijacking them and it's just leading them in what they believe is the most beneficial direction. It's one of the single biggest problems in humanity in general. Um, it's also why people are very, very bandwagon. It's why people jump onto trends. It's why it's very, very easy to demonize people in the media, right? In the media, they just pull up some clickbait, they cut something out of context. Everyone's like, boo, 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 because they just believe that they'll gain social value from doing that. It's the same reason why like the, they call that the latest thing, right? Or the latest trendy thing, and people get behind the latest trendy, uh, the latest trendy cause or things like that. And this is like a really, really big thing that's done um, to brainwash people is if you have some really dark agenda, you basically wrap it in this hyper, hyper, hyper trendy cause. That's basically how you get through any dark agenda that you want. You just gift wrap it in a trendy cause. You go, who believes in the trendy cause? And then everyone goes, yay. And then you even pick the people that are trying to actually do good. You frame them as the bad guys by cutting them out of context, put them in the media. And now the very people doing good things and trying to help, you can demonize. And the average person doesn't even want to look deeply enough into it. And they just jump on the trend. And you can basically just manipulate the masses like that. It's completely insane. And it's going on constantly. And it, and it, keeps, us at, it keeps the societal progression at a bit of a deadlock because it means that we can't have real debate about the best ways forward because we're basically just stuck on like manipulating large groups of people that just get easily swayed. It's uh, completely crazy. The, the system is totally insane. And I'm not even really sure how to fix it, but I can tell you that the best way to fix it that I can think of is to educate people on these ideas and maybe at some point this could make it into public school. 
You know, if you started to see this in public school and, you know, you'd kind of test people on their ability not just to believe in click clickbait or test people, don't just believe in the trend. Don't just jump on the bandwagon. Also, don't just jump on the counter bandwagon. A lot of people do that, right? They want to be uh, the, the kind of uh, contrarian. And then they join the contrarian tribe. And they want to be the top of the contrarian tribe without ever not realizing that a lot of mainstream things are correct. <laughs> so it's one of these things where it's a little bit tricky to see. But basically what you have, if I was to kind of summarize this for you, is you're sort of in this conflict between realizing all of the negative things that I just told you about raising your status, right? Do you want to raise your status? But there's all these negative things because you're attracting the wrong people. You're, you're basically attracting hanger honors that don't really care about you, but you're attracting a lot of them and they're really, really into you. Do you want to attract that? Or do you want to not learn this stuff and then you attract nobody? Okay? And so what I saw, here's kind of how I saw it over the years. Okay, I'm going to summarize it for you. What a lot of people would call like their non-superficial friends in most cases, not all cases, but most cases, what I generally saw was that these weren't people, it, it, it wasn't like if you go back to your small town, that you're in this like idyllic place where everyone's so real and they're all just like your real friends. Like that wasn't what I saw. I saw some of that. I definitely saw some of that and I enjoy engaging with that. I definitely saw some of that. But what I saw in a lot of small towns, first of all, was a lot of heavy, a lot of heavy drug use. Like you'll see things like crystal meth being very, very popular in some small towns. Hawaii has a problem with crystal meth to the point that they, they say uh, cook rice, not ice. And there's signs everywhere. <laughs> I would literally like, like see like, like high school kids running around trying to cop meth and stuff. It's scary. Imagine that. It's scary. So, I, you know, a lot of people smoking weed and a lot of people like, you guys get it that the whole point of self-help is like the lowest level people talk about each other, right? You guys know that, right? The lowest level people talk about each other. What did they do? What do I think of that? Because they're in a coping mechanism, so they're trying to get dopamine from feeling better than somebody else, right? High level people talk about how to make the world better for, for the world. High level people talk about inventions. High level people talk about ideas. High level people talk about expansion. Or high level people joke around and raise their vibe or they show gratitude, right? Low level people show lack of gratitude, they, they tend to have a victim complex, and they tend to talk about each other, and they tend to talk about why things are not possible. High level people talk about why things are possible. So what I saw was option A, sit around with other low level people complaining about everybody else. Do you guys ever, know, ever notice that low level people do this thing called triangulation, where they get together and then they complain about the person who's not there, but then when you're gone, then they complain about you? You ever see that? That's like a very common thing. So you can basically be in that, <laughs> right? And basically have it to where you could say, oh, it's like my real friends, but it's actually not. And any of those people, if they could get out of that, they would. So that's not really the answer there. So then you say, okay, I'm gonna raise my status. So now all of a sudden you get around better people and you get around higher level people and then they like you. But the problem is then you also get more fake friends and you get more uh, transactional relationship, so you're kind of inviting that into your life, okay? So that seems to be your two options. So here's what I would say is, is kind of what I've figured out over time, okay? Here's what I've sort of figured out over time. What you generally do is you raise your status, but you realize that 99% of people that are talking to you don't care about you at all, okay? That's the first thing that you need to understand. They don't care about you at all. It's purely what you can do for them. Now, they're in a trance and they don't know that, okay? They don't know that. Now, the reason why they don't care at all is because they are too much in coping to have the ability to see you as a human being. It's not that they are bad people. It's that they themselves are in coping and so they're unconscious. So knowing that, what you wind up doing is you can love them but it's a different kind of love. It's the love of giving, but not the love of needing anything back. Does this make sense what I'm saying here? It's the love of giving, but it's not the love of needing anything back, okay? This is why I love Christianity, because it talks about forgiving your enemies over and over, and it talks about how the people that persecute you don't know what they're doing, okay? They're unconscious. So you can love people, but not, but, but understand that they're in coping. So in, in the same way that you would love 
a beautiful animal that you see out in Montana, right? If you saw, if you saw a wolf in Montana, you'd say that's one of God's creations. That's a beautiful animal, and I love that. A human is certainly, even a low-level human, is certainly far more conscious than an animal, way more, but they're not really as conscious as what we think they are. Do you see the difference here? Right? They're not as unconscious as an animal at all. They're way more conscious, but they're certainly not nearly as conscious as the way that they're representing themselves or as the way that they think of themselves or as the way that we tend to think of them. They're, they're far, 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 far more unconscious than that. Okay? So they're, they're, they're definitely in like a dream state for 99% of people. So going from that standpoint, you can love people in the same way that you love life. You love plants, you love animals, you love life. You can also love people the way that you love a child. A child is not fully conscious yet. A child is still a victim of its emotions. Realize that most adults are in arrested development and they haven't come into enough thriving yet and awakening yet that they're also kind of stuck. Realize that you can love people the way that you love a child, the way that you would love nature, the way that you love any of God's creations. You can, lo you can love them for that way. Then what you do is over time, you realize the following things. Your friendships go in circles. So you have people at the outside of the friendship, and then you have tighter friendships or relationships. And so what you're looking for is, you're, is that people towards the outside are maybe people who you gain value from helping. You just, you're like, you know what, I don't even need anything from them, but I just gain value from helping. Then from there, you also have people as you pull in a little bit, who you realize are kind of semi-awake. They're semi-awake. And those are people that are also maybe doing things as well. And so you can engage in more transactional relationships with people like that. Like there's people who I can like, like you know, take for example club promoters who I know, right? There's certain club promoters who I know that I know have a cocaine problem. I understand that they're snakes. I get that. I understand that. They, they lack any kind of integrity. They lack any kind of object constancy. They lack that ability to, um, I'm not sure if I use that word object, object constancy perfectly, by the way. I might have messed that up a bit. But it's like what I'm referring to there, the way that I think of that word is like you're able to see that person in their entirety and you're not just having these whimsical changes in perceptions and RAS flips about them. You're just like, you're seeing them as they actually are largely rather than these continual ongoing RAS flips, which is what most people are stuck in. So a promoter who's a snake Hey, they call that the devil you know, right? Like, I understand that if somebody's out there, you know, promoting nightclubs, they're probably on a lot of drugs, they're probably drinking, and they probably know a lot of amazing people. And so I understand that these are not people who I can trust at a high level, but I understand that they can also help me to get into clubs, they can help me to fill up my parties, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand they're suffering. I understand that their life probably sucks a lot more than you think. So from that standpoint, I have love for them, I'll treat them well, but I also understand that it's a snake. And the same thing goes in business. Um, I've had friends over the years that I understand are completely transactional. I've watched the way that they treat other people. I've watched the fact that they have a lack of respect for other human beings and that they view them as objects. And so I understand that these are people who I can learn from. These are people who I can have financial interactions with. But I also understand that these are not people that, are, that see the depth of humanity at a very high level. I get that. I'm not afraid of this. I'm not mad about this. I'm not resentful about this. I'm okay with all of this. In fact, that's part of being a grown man, is understanding the different dynamics that's put in front of you. So knowing that and knowing that the world has snakes, the world has sharks, the world has a lot of derpers, then you've got to start to make sense of who it is that you have around you. And you've got to start putting the right people around you. Who is in your inner circle? Here's what it has to be. It has to be, it has to be the kind of person that if you broke up with your significant other, wouldn't try to go hook up with them. I've had that happen to me. I've had some of my very, I've had it to where, you know, I've had like a, one of my best friends in the world and I have a breakup and the next day he's hooking up with the person that I just broke up with. Now, so I remember when that happened, initially I laughed at it because I didn't want to see that person anymore. I thought it was funny initially. I started laughing. I was like, that's ridiculous. Like I literally just thought it was funny because I didn't want to keep seeing that person even though they had a lot of good things going for them, but I didn't really want to keep going. I'd moved on. But I was, so I laughed at it for about 10 minutes. But then I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, that's one of my best friends. He didn't know, he didn't know that I wasn't gonna be mad. A lot of people have quick breakups and then they get back together. That happens all the time. Who doesn't have a breakup for a day? What relationship doesn't have a day or two day breakup? That's crazy. He didn't even think of that. 
And this is one of my best friends. If I told you who it was, you guys, the whole room would have the energy sucked out of it. You guys would be like, no, you wouldn't believe it. But that'll happen. Why? Why did that happen? Why? It's just the animalistic part of the brain takes over. There's not enough consciousness there to say, I don't want to be that kind of a person. It's just not there, okay? You want to know the best example how I started to realize all this? When I used to do trainings when I was first starting out, I was flat broke for years, by the way. And so I would go from city to city and I'd go do a dinner break after the training. And these tra trains were very inexpensive. So I had just enough money. I basically would have just enough money to get an airplane ticket to the next city and barely enough money to eat dirt cheap food. We were eating off like Christmas gift certificates, things like that, okay? And so we'd all go for dinner and, and say that you had say six people or 12 people there. Inevitably, the bill would come up short almost every single time. The bill would come up short. And I remember thinking like, this is such a great group of people. I love everybody here. Why is the bill coming up short? And what I realized was over time, human beings in a big group have an RAS flip to where, let's say for example, that you ordered a 20, say, say you ordered a steak dinner that was $24.99. We weren't, we weren't eating in very fancy places, right? It was $24.99 for the steak dinner. But then there's tax, then there's tip, and then there's drink. The tax, the tip, and the drink could take that from 25 to, you know, call it 35, you know, whatever you'd call it, right? Whatever that is, I don't know, <laughs> okay? So let's call it 35. Well, if every single person there is shorting it by $10 or $15, and let's say I've got 12 people there, well, now I'm gonna owe $12 or 12 times $15. Now at that point, like now, I would take that money and just shoot it around in a money gun and a lot more. But at that point in my life, that was my ability to eat. So I'm looking at the group going, I'm not gonna have food this week. Why? What more could I have done for y'all? What more could I have done? Could I eat? But I wouldn't be able to eat. And this is with me sleeping on floors when I first started this. That's how we built the business, running around sleeping on floors. So, you know, our couches. So that would happen all the time. So what I realized was, wait a minute, like the first few times it happened, okay, first time it happened, I thought it's a fluke. Second time it happened, I thought another fluke. Third time it happened, I thought another fluke. Fourth time, I thought maybe it's one or two people. What I realized over time is it's every time. You can do that dinner experiment anytime you want. So you know what I did? I did a counter experiment. I said, everybody when you pay, write your name beside what you paid. That one simple act of saying, write your name on the receipt of what you paid, resulted in not only not having a short change, I would actually have about $100 extra. And I was honest and I'd say, hey, there's about $100 extra here, who wants back the 100 bucks? And people would say, no, no, keep it, you're doing a great program. So that's a little trick I got to make it through not going starving. And 100 bucks is a lot of money to me back then. And now I got an extra 100 bucks. And I did that trick for years. About seven or eight years later, I decided that I wanted to test that method. So I was on a program and I said, nobody sign, or I didn't say nobody signed the bill. I just didn't do that system. And it came back short. Now that was only with four people. So I sat there methodically trying to figure out, because I thought if it's only four people, I want to know who didn't pay. So I sat there and I figured out that everybody there was short, everybody. And then I couldn't figure out the last part of where it was short. And I sat there for 40 minutes or something like that, whatever it was, trying to figure out who didn't pay. And I couldn't believe it because I just couldn't figure out who didn't pay. Guess who didn't pay? You. I didn't pay. <laughs> That's pretty shocking. <laughs> you see that? What happened there? Biology takes over. It, it literally, your RAS tricks you. It's a certain, in groups, people act bad. If you get in a group, people act bad. If I'm in this big group here and I try to move you guys around in your chairs, 80, 90% of you will sit there dumbfounded like this, trying to get everybody else to do it. It's human nature to exert the least amount of energy and to try to get other people to exert the energy. This is a part of human nature. By the way, if we don't get this solved by the time that AI takes over, they're gonna kill us. <laughs> so we gotta figure something out here, <laughs> okay? Because the AI is gonna look at us and it's gonna see us as totally transactional and soulless, and then they're just gonna view us as human um, biomatter that needs to be cleansed. I don't know that for sure, I'm not pretending to, but kind of seems logical. So we need to probably do something about that. So, okay, and like, <laughs> soon. So the, um, the way to think about this is that that is kind of what you're dealing with. So when you raise your status, what are, you really, what are you really bringing on yourself? What are you actually bringing? 
you're bringing that exact dynamic down on yourself. But the problem is, is that if you don't, what's the alternative? The alternative is sitting in your derp town, all complaining about each other and trash talking each other and smoking meth. I'm kidding. Quick question on this. You look like you had an urgent question. So I have a question about derping. Yep. And, you know, I feel like a coll as a collective, we are healing the wounds of, of derping, right? Yes. But I, I think, would you say there's more derping now, like 2023, than yep. like 1980? Yes. Why, why is that? Um, because life, is, we had too much prosperity. And that's going to change. But we had too much prosperity. So, yeah, it's good. There's a lot of prosperity. And um, people, um, it, it, we go into this like, so what happens with capitalism is, it, is we start thriving so much that it becomes top heavy. So capitalism's main failure is that it creates so much prosperity that it winds up collapsing on itself. So you get so much prosperity that people get so disconnected from reality that now you can fool them and trick them more easily. Yep. I read something about this where I gave more prosperity, people started to value entertainment more than everything else. So that's where that comes from. Yep, you gave more prosperity, people prioritize entertainment, feeling good. Social causes that they have not even looked into the real background of it, all sorts of stuff like that. It's it's super duper crazy. So this is also why if you go to like say the you know the pharmacy, they'll be like, do you want to donate a dollar for Red Cross? Right? Like they yell it, right? And you're and you're like, yes, yes, you know, right? Like that kind of thing. I actually specifically say no every time they do that to train myself not to get brainwashed, even though I, I actually want to donate. But I'm like, I'm not doing it if you're gonna pressure me like that. So it's just one of those weird things. So basically what you want to do is you want to elevate your status, but then what you want to do is you want to start having those different circles. So you want to start bringing people into your life. At the closest circle, you've got to have a very, very deep understanding of loyalty with those people in your close circle that you are in it to win it and you are very, very, very loyal. Now I'm going to contrast loyalty against something else in a minute. But at a base level, I could definitely say where I failed, where I failed in the past, was I allowed, okay, I was lonely enough in life that I allowed people who I knew were too flimsy into my inner circle. That is what I would say is like one of the big mistakes that I've made in my life. Like I've made it where I had that level of loyalty, but that level of loyalty was not reciprocated. You know, like I thought that if I gave it, that I would receive it. But I didn't understand there's level, loyalty is a function of thriving and loyalty is a function of consciousness. If somebody is deeply, deeply traumatized, if somebody is more unconscious, they don't have the ability not to get RAS flip. They just don't, okay? So going from there though, there's a flip side of it, which is that loyalty can also be an excuse for laziness. So it depends on how you're looking at it. Right? So in other words, if you're working with somebody and then you claim to have loyalty, but then at the same time, you're not pulling your weight, well then, you know, what is, what is somebody supposed to do? Are they supposed to sit there with you limiting their own life experience because you can't pull your weight? So there's sort of a, it's, it's sort of a, a complicated understanding here between people who simply are too unconscious to possess loyalty versus when it's kind of your fault and the place that it's your fault is that you have to have a shared vision. You have to have a larger direction that you're going and you have to achieve alignment and you have to achieve clarity of expectations. So say the word a shared vision, shared. clarity of expectations, clarity. alignment, alignment. Accountability. accountability. And so, and, and a lot of that is also say, write things down, right, say it. Right. You guys are writing it down. Okay, say write things, write things down. Make little videos. Make little videos. Okay, so in other words, what you also want to do is you want to write things down and make little videos because what happens is, um, in the same way with the bill, where people just, uh, with, with, you know, with the bill, people wind up, um, they, you know, just like how I couldn't even see the bill, the biggest thing that you'll see with, with uh, agreements when they're not written down is people will distort the agreements. And this is just absolutely massive. You're gonna see this all the time, okay? Um, I first saw it because I remember I hired somebody to do some pieces of writing. And it was when I was first, first, first starting my business. And I said, I said listen, if you will do eight short pieces of writing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use them and send them to my list, 
if they're good, I'm gonna start paying you $50 per piece. But I'm running a brand new business, I got no money here, like, like I told you guys with my old life situation when I was first starting, I got no money here, so I can't even pay for anything, but if you wanna start doing this, and you can get it to get some traction, this is when I'm like 22, if you can start getting it to get some traction, um, I'll pay you $50 going forward. So he did, great guy by the way, he did the eight pieces of writing, and what happened was at the end of it, he said, hey, could you send me the 400 bucks? So do you see what happened there? I said, if it gets traction, if it works, I can start paying you 50 bucks per piece because I was brand new. I mean, we, we had literally, we were, we were penniless. You know, we're just we're basically bootstrapping, right? He would have a capacity to get involved with the company at a high level from the ground floor. But he remembered it as, after I finish the, the eight of them, you'll send me the 50 bucks per, send me 400 bucks. That's a pretty awkward situation because what do you think 400 bucks meant to me back when I was a kid? A month of dinner. That was a lot of dinner. <laughs> so now I, now, now I have to decide, do I want to send the 400 bucks and just keep this person around because actually I like their writing and I also don't want to look like a jerk or do I want to actually call it out and say, no, no, this is not what we agreed to, in which case we end the relationship. I wound up paying the 400 bucks. But that was one of the first times that I realized, okay, wait a minute, people see things very, very differently. It's, it's very, very true. The other thing that I realized about people's difference in perception is the emotion that they're addicted to. So if somebody is addicted to a state set point of like a six out of 10, they will tend to remember the past interactions that you've had as a six out of 10. So negative person, negative re recall. Okay, negative person, negative recall, positive person, positive recall. I tend to be somebody who is overly positive, even though I struggle with my own frustrations or sadness like any human, but I tend to be overly positive. So you could have people that completely stab me in the back, people that did me super duper dirty, all that kind of stuff, and you're like, what do you think of them? I'm like, you know, we had an amazing time. Yeah, it ended kind of weird there, but we had an amazing time. Man, that ending, I'll never understand that. But damn, we had an amazing time. Like, that's just the way that my brain works. I don't remember things in the negative. The problem with that, unfortunately, is I'm so delusional that I'll wind up going back to the same people that did crazy stuff. I'm like, they were awesome. Why did that end anyway? Let's go back. And I, I literally forget because all that I can remember is the positive. That's a good thing, but the downside of it is that I become blinded, right? Another thing also is that if you're, this is very, very key that you understand this. If you're somebody who has really, really good intentions towards people, Understand, like, like some people have never experienced hate. Some people have never experienced real anger, okay? If you're somebody who's just very, very positive, you probably don't hate anybody. You probably are never angry at anybody. And so you'll see people that hate you and that feel angry towards you or that steal from you, and you won't believe they could be doing it. You won't believe it, okay? So I will specifically keep very negative, angry, psycho people around me who can actually be my set of eyes to tell me when somebody is doing something bad. I do that because I don't have a choice. If I just leave it to myself, I will never believe anyone is doing something bad. I just never believe it. Because I don't project that on others because I wouldn't be doing that. So I will never ever believe that. So I have it to where like, people will be like, that person hates you. I'm like, no they don't. You know, no they don't. You'll even see this in politics where say that you have one political party that is people that are just more kind of like decent people. They won't believe that the other party literally wants them dead. They won't believe that. They just can't believe it. They're like, no, they don't. It's like, yeah, I don't know, you know, whatever, right? They can't believe it. Like, no, these people hate you, but they can't believe it. I know because I have that problem. Then you see what happens. You're like, maybe they do, you know, right? But you're like, no, right? And you just can't believe it. And that's something you have to be aware of that. Like, there's people out there who hate you. There's people out there who want to steal from you. There's people out there who resent you. And, and as you gain status, there's going to be people who objectify you. They view you as an object. They view you as somebody who could never be hurt. They view, you, they, they view you as someone who could never be hurt, who could never feel stabbed in the back, because your life is so perfect that if, that if they had what you had, you, they, they would never, never feel hurt, so why couldn't you just help them out? And you're gonna see a lot of that stuff too. And this is just sort of this ongoing thing. So over time, what you have to do is again, like my big failure was I gave the credit to people who really were not at that level that like they wouldn't act that way. That was like honestly what I told myself. I let a lot of people in, in a very deep way, who I never thought could behave in that manner. And then what I did was I worked with them and I elevated them to where I'm at. And I work with them, work with them, work with them, work with them because I love seeing people thrive. And then at that point where they get to where I'm at, then they turn sideways. And I saw many, many, many cases of this. I saw cases of it with theft, I saw huge amounts of cases of theft. 
um, you know, hooking up with the girlfriend the day after, all sorts of weird stuff like that. Things that, things that like I could tell you, you just wouldn't believe it. You know, like how much money do you think it takes to, to build an email list, for example? What do you think like we paid to build our email list? Millions of dollars, right? And you'll see people, they'll just go right in the email list, just take it, right? Now you'll never go to jail for that, right? It's funny, somebody from the inner city goes and takes, you know, a steak knife and goes and robs a 7-Eleven for 500 bucks, they go to jail for years. But you just take, you know, a multi-million dollar email list, ah, it's just like some little file, what's the big deal? Hey, I'm just trying to help people, I'm just trying to reach more people, I'm just trying to help them out. It'll never be viewed in that way. And you'll see stuff like that all the time. So it's one of these things where I've seen that at the highest levels because as you gain in status, you're gonna see a lot of bad stuff. You know what else you're gonna see as you gain in status? Your friends, significant others, are gonna try to hook up with you. Yeah, you're gonna get it where as you gain in status, your friends, significant others, will try to hook up with you. And you're gonna have to decide what to do. You're gonna have it where also you'll have different business partnerships and then they're gonna to come to you and they're gonna to try to cut other people out of the deal and crap talk them to benefit. You're gonna see a bunch of stuff like that too. So you're gonna see this wide range of very sickening behavior and, and it's just gonna go on and on and on and on. So it's one of these things where, again, I had to make it, I had to figure out my life. I had to be like, okay, well, you know, how does life work? How does this all work? Do I, want to, do I want to be this unconscious derper? Do I want to not raise in status? Do I want to be stuck in my head perpetually because I'm a low status person? Do I not want to bring better people around me? How do I, you know, what is it that I want to do? Right, and I've got to ask myself that. As I started going out to bars and clubs, I saw so much infidelity that my brain could barely process it. But you want to know the scariest thing about the infidelity that I saw? The people that I saw doing that would wipe it out like it never happened. How many times have I seen it where, you know, I'm messing around with somebody and they call their significant other from my bed? And, and it's terrifying. You know, when you see it, it's terrifying. It really, it really is terrifying, you know? I've had it where, like, I can see that someone, someone I'm dating is, like, literally monkey branching because maybe I'm struggling. They start monkey branching. And I'll ask them about it. I'm like, you know, are you monkey branching? Like, what's going on? They're like, no, no. You know, I, I had one happen to me. I remember I was like, I think that you're gonna start dating this guy. And she's like, no, no, I would never do that. And I'm like, no, I, I kind of think you are. No, no, I would never do that. I'm like, okay, so then I forget about it. A couple months later, I'm like, do you just wanna go date this guy? Like, what is, you know, just go date him if you want. No, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, later what happened? I had a bit of a hard time. Well, she didn't date that guy, but she dated his business partner, <laughs> right? That's why my gut instinct was telling me that, but she dated his business partner, okay? So, you know, now when that happens, is it gonna be like, hey, I'm so sorry that, you know, you literally have been calling this out for eight or nine months. I'm really sorry about that. Is that what they're going to say? No, they're going to say, you're the bad guy, right? You're the bad guy. It's not going to be, hey, you know, I'm really sorry I did that. You also did some things wrong, but, you know, you did some things wrong too. That's why I felt inclined to do this, which I would actually accept that, by the way. I don't, you guys wouldn't accept that, right? I would. It takes two to tango. I would. No, it does. You know what? If you're not treating somebody the way that you could, they may be inclined to do that. It's a survival mechanism. It's, it's human. It's a very human thing to do. It's totally human. It's a very human thing to do. Who, who, who of us here is not human, right? So I'm not gonna judge it. But then why make me the bad guy? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? Well, what is that? It's because the person can't deal with their shame around it. So they've got to make someone else the bad guy. So it's one of these things where it's like, that is just a lot of human nature. You'll see that, you'll see that stuff go on your whole life. But the question is, how do you handle it? How do you think about this stuff? And again, it's like what I told you. And here's what I'm gonna tell you what, what the real answer is, okay? Here's what it really is. The first one is raise your status as high as you can. Now, after everything I just said, does that surprise you that I say that? No. Raise your status as high as you can within the context of the lifestyle that you want, within the lifestyle, within the context of, of the amount of time that you wish to dedicate to it, because you may have other hobbies, but raise it as high as you can. Do not hold back based on the things that I told you. Don't. From there, Keep failing forward and keep learning. Keep failing forward and keep learning. Just this tutorial that I gave you here has accelerated your learning curve. Half a decade or a decade if you actually listen to it and pay attention to it. Okay, if somebody would have told me this from the start, I would have had context. I would have understood, would have understood it. Once you understand RAS flips, it, it saves you a lot of time and heartache and trouble. Okay? Now, raise, 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 raise. Now, from there... Again, you have your tight group, 
you have your looser group, you have people who you actively dislike, like snakes and sharks, but who you just have transactional relationships with, and then you have people that are a bunch of derpers, and you love them anyway. Okay? That is how you actually manage this whole thing. So, in effect, okay, now, and then the big one is, don't just give that status of someone who's super, like, you know, ride or die, don't give ride or die status to somebody who has not exhibited that for other people. If you see that the person that you're giving ride or die status to has an ongoing habit of crap talking to other people, has, has an ongoing habit of being ungrateful, has an ongoing habit of a lot of burnt relationships or things like that, don't give them that status. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They're not. They're just waking up. They're coming into their consciousness. They may in five years, in 10 years, in five months, become the kind of person that's ride or die. They actually could, but they're not there now. Okay? My problem was I make a lot of excuses for people. The average person who does me dirty, I, want, I call them to apologize. I'm not, I, I, I'm not kidding you. I'm not even kidding. Now, why is that? Because I feel like if you're the bigger person, just do that. Easy. Right? Be the bigger person. So, okay, and, I mean, and when I give an apology, I mean it. That's not fake. I mean what I'm saying. Because I, I will always take responsibility for my part of where things fell apart. But then again, it's like I told you, a lot of the time, they would have, those things that they were unhappy with, they would have been happy with had you been on the up and up. So it's a, weird, it's a weird dichotomy to where if you feel that someone, if someone's upset with you, own what you could have done better to keep becoming a better human being, but also realize that the other half of it was you shouldn't have fallen off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of those two things, right? Because the truth is, you could see that, you could fall off, you could get back on your grind, start hitting up bars, start hitting up clubs, having a lot of social success, then you could start making more money, get in better shape, start doing parties, start winning, you'd see that exact same person two years later as you've transformed, and you, you wouldn't be all upset like, hey, let's talk about what happened. You'd just be laughing, you know, you'd just be laughing and having fun. They'd see you over with a bunch of cool people, they'd start looking over and be like, hey, right, and then they'll come over and be like, how have you been, oh my God. I miss you. But then the same person who, if you had fallen off, then it's like, I hate them, they suck. You, you see what I'm saying here? You ever had it where someone insults you when you're out, and then if you don't care about it, they're like, ha, 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 like they're joking. But then if you do care, then they mean it. So these are these little flips that happen, okay? So, what you ba so again, basic understanding. Tight group, ride or die. Within that ride or die, you also have to stand up to your shared vision as well. Because you can turn, a, uh, you can turn a, a prince or princess into a frog if you don't have a shared vision, if you don't write things down, if you don't make little videos, and if you don't keep adding the value to that relationship of what you said that you're gonna do. It shouldn't be pure transactional, but it should be the kind of thing where there's, a sh there's shared understandings that have accountability to them. Mm -hmm. What do you mean little videos? Okay, say that you and I were in a business together, right? And I'm like, okay, you're gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. I can just literally pull my phone out and be like, hey, so like we were saying, bro, just for future reference, I'm gonna do this, what are you gonna do this? Okay, done. Now later, when you have an RIS flip, and you call me up and you say, I thought it was this, I go here, let me check, pull out the video. I, I, I get text message of everything, I screenshots, I get a lot of screenshots, I do a lot of videos, all that kind of stuff, because people are always having RIS flips, all the time, okay? So, um, have a shared vision, check in on the shared vision, and so on and so forth, but, Again, if you do the shared vision thing well enough, you can often even keep the fickle people. Somebody who's ride or die should be at a point where if you deviate a bit off the shared vision, they're not gonna have a flip out and bounce, okay? That's ride or die people. Then you have transactional people. Those are people who basically, if you give them what they want, they'll give you what you want. Why is that? It could, it could be two different reasons, two different reasons. One is, very fair reasons. Fair reasons are, you're not their brother, you're not their best friend, you're doing business. Like they say, business is business, right? So if it's somebody who is transactional, then they, they don't have like a life, they don't have a brotherhood with you, they don't have a marriage with you. So if that's the case, then fair enough, right? That's fair. But the problem is when you try to bring somebody like that in as a ride or die. That's the problem is when you try to take someone who was a transactional relationship and make it ride or die. You didn't recognize the distinction between the two. So then you're shocked later when, you know, maybe you did one little thing wrong and they freaking freak out or something like that. You're shocked. 
but you shouldn't be shocked. You just, you misinterpret it. By the way, they're never going to tell you that it's transactional, right? They're not, they're not going to say, yo, this was transactional. So it's one of these things where they're not going to say, hey, by the way, like, you know how you're taking me out for dinners and like, you're telling me your life story and like, you're bonding with me. I'm kind of just transactional with you, right? They're not going to say that. They also may not know that. They themselves may not be aware of it. They may feel as though you are um, their friend, right? But then that flips later, okay? And then you projected a friendship there that doesn't exist. Got it? So that's the next level. Then from there, like I said, you have just straight up sharks, straight up snakes. You, you recognize who the snakes are. Those are people who just like, you understand that they're just like really bad people but you can learn stuff from them, right? Like, I'm sorry to tell you, like the average club promoter, like, I'm sorry to tell you, like, come on, you know, just come on, right? But does that mean that you never want to make use of a club promoter? You know, right? You should, you should absolutely be friends with club promoters. But, and, and some of them are really great people. But the problem is with the club promoting is they get hooked on drugs. So how can somebody who's not in integrity with themselves, how can they be possibly in integrity with you? If somebody is a drug user, how much integrity can they have towards you? They have no integrity towards themselves. They're literally frying their own brain to make a deal with the devil to feel good right now. And yet somehow you think they're gonna treat you well? How's that possible? They don't even treat themselves well. And you think they're gonna treat you well? That doesn't make any sense. It's impossible. So, but that doesn't mean that you should not know any club promoters. Like, oh, I couldn't be around them, right? You're trying to make a ride or die out of someone who's a snake. A lot of great club promoters, by the way. I'm not, I'm, I shouldn't even be saying what I'm saying because you're gonna get the wrong impression. I'm just saying that some club promoters have drug issues. So. If that's the case, then you understand where they stand. And then the last group, which is the biggest group, is derpers, right? And the love to a derper is the love that you give to God's creation. When you, when you look at, like, uh, you know, a beautiful wolf running around Montana, do you hate it? If you see, a, I saw a lynx the other day. How cool is that? What are the chances you see a real-life lynx? Do you hate the lynx? No, of course not. You saw a bobcat, would you hate it? No. no, it's an animal, right? It's a beautiful animal. Do you hate a squirrel? No, right? I'm not, now, by the way, people that are like that are still a lot more human than a squirrel are. They have a lot more consciousness than a squirrel, but it, understand, say it's a continuum of consciousness. It's a continuum of consciousness. Okay, say that again. It's a continuum of consciousness. Again. It's a continuum of consciousness. Again. Okay, so in other words, some people are just more unconscious than others. Okay, that's what you've got to understand. Some people are just more unconscious than others. Now, in saying this, I'm assuming that most of you guys are in the camp of derpers. So don't play the hero in this movie. You should be, okay, if you're already like, yeah, the derpers, you're the derper. If you're going, maybe I'm the derper, you're probably not the derper. <laughs> okay? The person, okay, the person who's saying, Am I one of the derpers? Do I do that? Am I already slipping a lot? That's the person who's probably actually doing that less. And the person like, yeah, 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 the derpers, the derpers. That's the person who's probably the derper. That's how it works, right? Because the mind is, so, is, not, is unable to self-reflect. Okay, because everybody's doing this to a, to a decent degree. So my best advice to you is raise your status as much as you can. And then, like, like if you go to see people that are, like, this is what I've learned from like, the highest level people that I know, right? You go meet the highest level people. They're nice to everybody. Highest level people are nice to everybody. But they're nice to you in a way that they know that you want something. And so they're like, hey, what's up? Hey, good to meet you. They'll make great eye contact, good to meet you, and then they keep it moving. Because they understand what that is. They get what that is. They're not, now here's the thing. They're not mad at you. They're not resentful. They don't judge you. They wish you the best. They will even help you to the extent that there's a very powerful spiritual component in helping somebody who's unconscious. So they'll even help you but they fully understand what you are. They get it. They, 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 it's not their first rodeo, okay? Then from there, they're probably very, very tight with their family, and they're probably very, very tight with their inner circle. They probably have a lot of transactional relationships that they manage, and they also manage relationships with some snakes that they understand are just purely transactional and looking for win-win, but knowing that that person will bite them any chance they get. They get all that stuff. But from that standpoint, continue to raise your status. Because again, as complicated as this sounds, what is your alternative? Okay, because again, it, you will be very, very surprised 
that not engaging with this kind of thing is not the answer either. I thought of everything. I literally sat there thinking of every possible option. Like for example, I have seriously considered dropping all this and just being a minimalist. Okay, now when you guys see that, you guys are like, no, he couldn't do that. Like I bet you guys think that I'll always do seminars like this, right? I would always do seminars like this. You could wake up tomorrow and as long as I fulfilled all my obligations for programs that I've sold, and I'd never do one of these again. And I'll switch like that. Now that probably shocks you. Because if I wake up tomorrow and I realize that there's a better way to live life, I will switch so quick your head will spin. I am not committed to any one way of seeing life. So I have seriously contemplated things like minimalism. I have definitely contemplated it. Um, I, have comp I have contemplated monogamy, non-monogamy, kids, no kids, Whatever type of lifestyle you can think of, I've contemplated. And what I've basically discovered over time is that in my view, a lot of that is escapism. It's trying to escape from what's presented to you in front of your face. It's just escapism. And what I generally saw was people who engage in things, whether it's minimalism, uh, not, not everybody by the way, but things like minimalism or things like, like for example, I'm very, very against drug use. You guys think in your mind that I have an ego around this. You guys probably think that I'm like, no, I'm just the type of person that doesn't use drugs and I can never use drugs. I could wake up tomorrow and just start piling down drugs, tomorrow. I could start doing hard drugs by the end of the seminar if I believe that that was the right thing to do. Now that shocks you, you're like, what? No, you guys don't understand how quickly I will flip because if I get presented with better data, I will flip. The main reason that I stuck with what it is that I'm teaching you here now is what I saw whenever people don't do the kind of thing that I'm talking about here is huge amounts of self-deception. Major, 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 major loss of discernment and major loss of your own will. So what I basically saw over time was that choosing not to engage with these dynamics was escapism. And so what I see happening, here's kind of the way that I would summarize this for you. I want you to think of it like you have your will, you have your conscious will, you have discernment, and you have independent access to flow. And that if you maintain these three things, you expand. So think of it like this, okay? Your will is always being manipulated so that you will think that you want things that you don't actually want. You need to understand this, okay? Your will is being manipulated constantly to think that you want things that you don't want. Your discernment and your ability to detect reality is constantly being manipulated to think that you want things that you don't want. And then the big one, and this is really, really big, is that things are trying to get in your system to remove your independent access to transcendent states. That last one's probably the most important. You'll, you'll glaze over it, you'll just be like, oh yeah, yeah, uh, like that, right? You won't listen. But if you could listen, you could learn something important. Everything is trying to block you from independent access to a transcendent state. Why? Because as long as you don't have independent access to a transcendent state, your will and discernment can be manipulated for other people's agenda. Okay? As long as you need something to feel good, as long as you need something to feel complete, as long as you're afraid to die, you are going to consistently have manipulations being put on you all the time. You're basically being hijacked. Your will is being hijacked. And trust me, when you understand persuasion at a high level, you will see to what degree you are susceptible to this. It is shocking. And if you understand persuasion and what's going on, you will realize that the average mass that you're seeing is completely hypnotized. And it's terrifying. Okay, it is absolutely terrifying. Funny, again, someone from the inner city can go take a steak knife and go rob a place for 500 bucks, you get put in jail. But if you hijack their will unconsciously, oh, that's okay. Look, end of the day, I'm not even saying that you shouldn't get in trouble for doing that. I'm just making the point that we don't understand the extent to which we get hijacked. So what I see happening is when we don't engage with life as it is and we hide from life, we wind up getting our will stolen from us. And the reason what I see happening is that your emotional state becomes God. Your emotional state becomes God. Your comfort becomes God. Hiding becomes God. So this is a really, really big thing in religion is they say God first. You ever heard that expression, God first? What does that mean even as an atheist when they say put God first? It means that you have a North Star. What it means 
When you say God first, it means a few different things. One thing that it means is that you have independent access to transcendent states. Say the word independent access, independent to, access. Transcendent to transcendent states. So that's one thing where it says God first. Another one is your North Star. Say the word your North Star. Your North Star. Another one means connecting to the energy of life. Say connecting to the energy of creation. So in other words, you have this opportunity to be alive and to actually engage with life and to add to life. So your ascendance, including raising your status, raising your skills, raising your competence, learning to navigate these complicated social situations is a part of you engaging with that divine mission or with that worldly mission. But it gives you that North Star. So you can't necessarily escape this stuff Okay, you could try to escape it, but it's gonna get you in some other way. You're thinking you're escaping it, but it's gonna get you in some other way, okay? So from that standpoint, you wanna be thinking bigger picture about what it is that you're trying to do on this journey. So I'm laying a lot of very, very heavy stuff in you here today, right? Anybody here feel a little bit heavy? Yeah. Okay, I'm trying, I like to do different types of speaking, okay? I do different styles. You ever see ones where I do all jokes? Yeah. Okay, sometimes I do peaceful enlightenment ones. Sometimes I try to do very grounding, heavy, stressful speeches. I like to kind of mix up the vibe, okay? Depending on what I'm feeling at the moment, what's on my mind. So I wanted to engage you here with some heavy stuff because you're gonna hit, you know, big, big road bumps at different points in your life. And these are, these are gonna be things that like a, like a brick are gonna crack you in the head. Like it's gonna be like someone came up to you from behind with a brick, I'm not gonna do anything to you, and they just smack you from behind and your, your brains are bleeding out of your head. And you're like, how could you do this? Why? Why would this happen? How could this possibly happen? I don't understand. And that's gonna happen in your life. And so I want you to not give up and understand that as you build yourself up, these things are gonna come along and try to break you, okay? Like, people that you trusted with your life will discard you like toilet paper. People that you thought were ride or die will pull a knife out and stab it right in your back. People who you're engaging with that you thought that you're helping, the exact same people that you thought that you're helping will flip around and try to harm you. You will have it to where as you grow and grow and grow, you feel like you're winning, and then you get dragged right back down and kick lower down than when you started. Think about that. You'll go up and you'll get taken down so hard that you'll go, you'll go beyond the low, low past the place that you started. Like you started here, you went to here, you'll get kicked down so hard, you'll go boom, down like that. And all that you'll have when you're kicked down like that is the basic knowledge that you got from that first climb. Right, it's like you're climbing a mountain, you get kicked down so hard, all you have is the knowledge from that first climb. But that knowledge is worth millions. That experience is worth billions if you make it that way. So understand that it's the knowledge that you're getting and constantly iterating and constantly understanding what's happening, that's the real value. It's also embracing the lessons of life and making it like a spiritual journey to try to understand the world objectively. And it's making it a spiritual journey to find beauty in the world despite seeing the ugliness. Because so much of spiritual growth that you're gonna see is based on a lying perception of the world. It's a perception of the world that doesn't exist. All is love and light. All is great. All is love. Okay, cool, I'll kick you in the shins. Boom, ow! Right, you'll see a lot of Venice Beach, sticky, icky, syrupy, bubblegum fairies making up lies about what the world is, completely in a delusional zone that has been propped up by war, by civil rights movements, by sacrifice, by blood, sweat, and tears. And towards the end of an empire, you'll see entire ends of the coast. Just, oh, love and light. Just love and light. These people couldn't even handle a parking ticket. Okay? Same people, I've seen this. People you see saying that. Love and light. Wait a minute, I owe 60 bucks for parking? This is BS. Why? Because they're just worshiping their state. Real enlightenment means understanding what this world is. What is this place? Where are you? And who are you beyond? So once we get that, then you can find love for other people for what they actually are. Okay? And that's the idea of Jesus on the cross. Forgiveness for what people actually are. They hated him for no reason. They hated him because he's good. That's why they hate him. That's why they kill him. 
But it's awake, it's that the rebirth through that process, forgiveness through that process, that is the awakening of the soul. So through this larger process, there's dimensions of yourself that will begin to awaken. Deep, deep aspects of yourself that awaken that if you just do minimalism, or if you just hide from this, or if you just go everything love and light, you're never gonna actually wake up. Okay, you're never, ever, ever wake up. So this journey itself, ideally, the way that it pans out is this. It's not meant to be easy. It's here to be a challenge. It's here to demand a lot from you. In the process of this journey, you will come to understand the world a lot better. You'll come to hate the world, and then you'll come to love the world. But anybody who tells me that they love the world, and, and if I say, well, have you ever hated the world? If you haven't looked at the world with such disgust and thought of that, I don't believe that you're on the other side of enlightenment yet. I would only believe that someone's truly enlightened if I said, have you ever seen the world as so disgusting that you just don't even want to live here? You're so sickened. And if they say, you know what? I have. I, I see the sickness in me. I see the sickness in other people. What's it say in the Bible? Don't judge the chip in your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye. First remove the plank in your own eye, then talk about the chip in your brother's eye, is the paraphrase, right? So in other words, you will, you'll hit a point of sickness with everybody else, and that's when you say to yourself, wait, no, I'm sick with me. Right, that moment where I realize that I'm the one that didn't pay the bill. Right, I realize I'm the one who didn't pay the bill. Right, so it's that moment of sickness with yourself, then once you've seen that, now you're coming from a standpoint that you can say, no, I love all human beings. I love the world, the world is all beautiful. If you say, I've been through that phase and now everything is love and light, maybe I'd even listen to you. Probably not. But maybe I'll listen to you a little bit, okay? So you've got to come to the point where you hate yourself. Okay, here's how it goes. You hate people, you hate the world, you hate yourself. Once you've seen that, then you can forgive people, forgive the world, forgive yourself. Then you can find beauty in people, beauty in the world, beauty in yourself. But until you've actually gone through that process and understood what it is, you don't really love the world, you don't really love yourself, you don't really love other people. You have unresolved pain around your own behavior, which you're projecting onto others and masking. You're having unresolved pain on other people's behavior. You're having un unresolved pain towards the world itself, okay? Because you only need to look at like a nature documentary or an ocean documentary and watch every fish eating every other fish, every animal killing every other animal. You ever see that Instagram channel called Nature is Metal? Because, you know, on BBC, it's, which are incredibly beautiful documentaries, you see the animal hunt each other, but then they, it's like, you know, the cheetah grabs the impala, and then it, it just kind of goes away. They just kind of roll around. It goes away, right? Nature is metal. They show, like, the, the dripping guts and the suffering. And you realize that, like, this is, like, what the world is, right? We're in this sort of purgatory realm where everything's just killing everything else. Because what it really is that everything's taking energy from everything else, and everybody is competing, right? Everybody's in perpetual competition. But see, it's that the perpetual competition that we see and the delusional rationalizations around it, that is at the level of the physical. But there's a transcendent level of that in the spiritual realm that is actually a transcendence of it. So we have to, so see, the derper is somebody who doesn't even acknowledge the competition itself. They're just like, no, everyone's like my friend, but not realizing like all this weird backstabbing and stuff, they just can't even process it. Then somebody who's at a higher level can recognize the ongoing competition and they say, you know what, I'm gonna step up through this process of competition. I'm gonna embrace it, I'm gonna embrace that life is hard, I'm gonna embrace the pain of it, and I'm gonna compete in this to carve out my little corner of the universe. And that's the next level. The next level, however, is getting to a point where you reach a transcendent state where you're so much in a flow that nobody can touch you. And what winds up happening is in the transcendent state, here's a couple different qualities that it has. One is it removes self-generated resistance. Say that word, removes. removes. Self-generated self resistance. resistance. So in other words, what's happening is that when you're too much in that competitive paradigm, what'll happen is you actually create energetic parasites on the mind that take over. It actually hijacks your discernment and your will. It actually takes you over. And so you could be at the point where you could be talking to somebody and they're completely nice, but you make them into the other so that you can sort of justify your ongoing thought process and the ongoing parasitic entity of the mind. So what happens is that when you're too, so basically the derper is just like this sort of pile of gloop, okay, metaphorically, not literally. It's like a pile of gloop. It's just like, I don't know. Yeah, people are nice. All this stuff happened. Derp, right? It's like, who knows? 
right? Somebody who's more realistic, like by the way, sociopaths, you wanna know how sociopaths justify their behavior? They feel, because I know sociopaths, what I've talked to them about, they actually feel that they're more authentic. They're like, look, you know these people would screw you over anyway. You know these people would sell you out for a pack of bubble gum. Why don't you just admit it and then just go from there? So they actually feel that there's, like a, there's an authenticity to the sociopathy, that they are seeing things more clearly and rationally. They also view it that things like ethics are actually self-imposed limitations that is a disease of the mind. That's how they see it, right? So they view it like, imagine you're playing a game of chess and you have no rules, like you can take a pawn and just go boom, 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 boom and kill everything. But then this other person's like, no, like this piece can do this, this piece can do that. Then you're, they view it as ethics is this sort of self-limiting um, paradigm that's, that's fictional like the Tooth Fairy or like the Easter Bunny. And basically that people limit their life experience by having ethics. And then they view it that like, look, these people would sell you out for a pack of bubble gum anyway, so why not just admit that and take action? That's how they see it. But what they don't realize is that you'll see this in sociopaths, the number one thing they struggle with is discernment. They, and they struggle with discernment and they also create connections to low vibe energy. And as a result of that, they wind up getting completely taken over by low vibe energy. It's literally like the movie Star Wars in real life, like the dark side, you know, where you see it's like aging them, it's messing with their ability to see reality. Most sociopaths believe in their mind that they're the ones that are objective. They are so lost in their own sociopathy that they're more delusional than a derper in many cases. More delusional even than a derper. Um, they're correct about a lot of things that the derpers are wrong about, like huge, huge, huge amounts of things that the derpers are wrong about that the derpers can't see because the derpers are too naive to see. But then on these critical, critical, critical areas, what happens is it messes with their discernment. So that's why they say that in spiritual growth, you gain in discernment. Because it's when you, why do we gain in discernment, by the way? What's the main key? Does anyone know? Based on what I told you? It's when you have independent access to transcendent states. The independent access to transcendent states is what allows you to have discernment. Why do you guys think that is? Because you're not consumed by that low vibration energy. You're not consumed by low vibration. What else? You're able to see outside of yourself. You're able to see outside yourself. What else? Not identified with the material things. Not identified with the physical things. It's also, you don't need anything. You're not need, see, somebody who needs something, that warps the mind. That, that's a derangement process in the mind. So when you have independent access to flow states, there's much, much less of that, of that derangement, right? People who have a burning need for something, you know, remember I'm talking about like the ride or die and all that kind of stuff? People who have that burning need, they're in a coping state. They can't even do things like be a ride or die. Be, and, 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 and that when they do leave, they can't help but delude themselves because of the fact that they need something. And so the, the, the urgent need that they have in their mind winds up warping and twisting their thoughts. So there's a lot there. So what the sociopath views as a limitation on the chessboard is actually only partially correct, but it's actually entirely incorrect because they can't see reality correctly. Now what a sociopath would say if they heard this is, yeah, right, that's not true because the disease of the mind has, has overtaken them, so they can't see it. They think I'm crazy, they can't see it. They also marvel at the results that I do get. They're like, how does he get those results that are better than mine? And then they have to lie to themselves to say that their results are better because they, again, the discernment. And then, but then they're in cognitive dissonance and then what they do is that to shove down that cognitive dissonance, they have to mumble on and on and on about how they're better. Like they're always like, I'm better, I'm the best, I'm better, I'm the best. And they have to do this all the time to get rid of the cognitive dissonance. So they're already in a weird lack of discernment state having to use mental energy to stuff down all of their, uh, all the dissonance they're experiencing in the mind. So there's all these different levels that you can get to when you connect to the spiritual dimension. So you wind up actually transcending that state. For example, when you have independent access to a transcendent state, you're not as limited on energy, right? The whole idea of competition is, an, is a limit of energy. But when you have unlimited energy, then you're not stuck in that competitive state. So you'll see that these, that these states go further. So what you've basically seen here is me doing a summary of what it is that I've learned over decades of going out, actually, okay? So you're seeing me as somebody who's very, very shy, very, very, very low status, doesn't have a lot going on, then you're, and you're seeing me suffering in a major, major way, then you see me say, okay, I've got to step up, I start stepping up, I start raising my status, I get all these weird, freaky, weird things happen, like, you know, I think I'm getting into a relationship, then the person loses interest and dumps me because I was able to maintain status for a bit and then I lost it, I go through a whole series of those, I get frustrated, I go out like freaking crazy, I build up my business, I build up my brand, I start getting better people in my life because I grew up very lonely. I build that up, build that up, 
Then I see many of these like really disgusting and sickening and disappointing uh, things happen that I talked about here in the speech. I go through that for a period of time. Then I start to realize that you need to make bigger distinctions and who it is that you're surrounding yourself with. You need to have clearer discernment. You need to have clearer rules. You shouldn't just give up. Then I go through that period. Then I compete at higher levels. Um, then we go on to become the head of our industry. Do that for a long time. Watch that go. See changes happen there. Watch how that impacts people who I'm around, et cetera, et cetera. How it impacts my own self-esteem. How that impacts me personally. Then I just keep going from there. And then through that extreme pain that I went through, that's where I really, really went deep in the spiritual component of it. That's what took me to the next level of my understanding. And in those higher levels of understanding, I see the next paradigm. And I can see where I'm going more clearly. So I see where the journey is taking me. And what I feel sad about is a lot of people that are not on the journey. They haven't even started the journey. So what they're doing is they're just stuck. They're just kind of stuck on this little island. And then they're looking at maybe what I've gone through. They see that it's tough. And then they say, oh, that's tough. I don't want to go through that. It's too scary. When in fact, my real view is that you should have a clear-eyed understanding of what it is that you're stepping into, but then you should go for it. And again, I'm telling you this because otherwise you make your emotional state into God, you make comfort into God, you don't grow, you stagnate, the mind calcifies and ossifies as you get older. What does the average person look like when they get older? They look very ossified, calcified, they, they don't have a lot going on, and that's actually what you usually wind up becoming if you don't engage in a path of growth. So stop viewing yourself as here just to experience pure pleasure. Oh, I'm just here only for pleasure, for hedonism. Because if you make that God, then what winds up happening is you wind up calcifying. You actually wind up with less pleasure overall. Your definition of pleasure will also change through this process. So your definition of pleasure will also become things like um, the increased understanding of the world will actually be a greater reward for you. Seeing the world more objectively will become a greater reward for you. Um, understanding yourself and others. Understanding what this place is. And through the pain of what it is that you're going through, the pain is a cleansing process that cleanses you of delusion, of fairy tale thinking, of convenient thinking, of weak thinking. The pain will cleanse you of your own weakness, physical weakness, mental weakness, spiritual weakness. It will cleanse you of this. But you've got to keep going into that pain. So each time that you get taken and your head just gets boom, 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 boom under the, under the water and you're being basically like waterboarded, you've got to actually come back to center and you've got to view it like, okay, so here's how you got to view it. What is the weak part of me that is not able to survive this that I have to let go? Okay. What's the weak part of me that I have to let go? And what is the strong part of me that I have to double down on through this process? And if you continue to do that, then what happens is it's like they call it the narrow road, right? And as you, as you move further and further along, the road becomes more narrow, okay? So wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. And so what happens is that it gets more and more and more narrow. And what you'll find is, at the upper ends of the mountain climb that we're talking about here, you're going to see people at the top that have a lot of very, very similar commonalities. Deeply, deeply rooted self-esteem. Very deeply rooted self-esteem. Very, very high levels of responsiveness to the world. They get what's happening and they're able to respond to it at a very, very high level. They also will have great joy and laughter but it's not the laughter and joy of a delusional person who's never come into real pain or friction. It's gonna be the joy that comes from, it's a different type of joy. Young person's joy is this kind of youthful exuberance that's like a once in a lifetime experience that you get when you're young. When you're older, the joy that you get is what, here's what you start to realize. This place is freaking crazy, okay? This place is nuts, whoa. Like this, this place, whoa, you're gonna see that. You're also going to realize we're all a mess. You're going to see that. And it's when you realize that we're all a mess, then you're going to realize this experience is really, really short. And so basically, we're born into this total purgatory realm hot mess. This total hot mess. You're a mess. Everybody else is a mess. And you're going to realize that a lot of the bad things that happen to you you were actually very, very lucky. You were lucky that those bad things happened to you 
because you actually had a rare chance to wake up out of the days, out of the derp. And so you'll see people derping, and rather than being mad at them, you'll just feel very grateful and fortunate that you actually had the, the, the bucket of cold water on the head to wake you up. You'll feel appreciation. You'll see people that do wrong by you, and you're not going to be mad at them. You're going to feel empathy for them. It's sad that you did that. You must carry a lot of deep inner wounding to, to have done that, and you must, really, you must be really having to hide from reality to justify that. Like, remember, when someone does something very, very bad to you, they have to justify that in the mind with things like projection, like projecting it on you or justifying it. Once they've engaged that little deal with the devil, they're now unable to see reality in many other areas. Maybe they need to start a weed habit to, in order to make that make sense to them or start drinking to make, them make sen that make sense to them. Or they start doing other bad things because they make one little deal with the devil and it consumes your soul. Right? You make that one deal with the devil, you get power from it, now you're being fueled by low vibration energy, and they actually, you'll actually see a tangible change in people's energy to where they invite that energy into themselves, and they go deeper and deeper and deeper down. So you're not mad at them. Right? That's why, again, at the end of the Bible, or at the end of the Gospel, the big idea being forgiveness. People don't know what they're doing. Like, it's, actually, it's actually really sad. You know, and you don't want to contribute to that dynamic by hating them because when you hate them, now you're actually feeding that same energy that got at them. You see what's going on there? So you wind up seeing people with great pity, but you also wind up realizing life is so incredibly short. It is just so short. It is such a brief and short experience that even if this place is a mess, you have this one thing that trumps all of it. One single thing that trumps all the BS. And that is the gift of consciousness. And that one gift of consciousness that so few people will fully realize, they'll realize parts of it, but so few people will fully realize that, that is the gift, okay? The awakening itself is the gift. And I have rarely seen that kind of awakening with someone that just hides and meditates, although it does happen. I've seen it more predominantly in people that faced the world for what it was, fought their way through their battles, slayed the dragons, took the hits, took the punches, and you come out on the other side in a better place. Because at the end of the day, look, let's be real, right? As much as you say, like, I want to be happy in life, I want to be happy in life, how many of you in this room are really happy even now? How many of you in this room really, day to day, are really that happy? Most of your day is trying to survive through a lot of very boring things, try to make yourself fulfill these various responsibilities, being annoyed at various different things, how much, how much of an average day are you actually really even that like, like exuberantly happy? Now, with mind training, you can expand that quite a bit. If you train your mind for gratitude, train your mind to laugh, train your mind to meditate, but consider the fact that to just generally be happy, you've got to train your mind to do that. You know, like train your mind to laugh more, train your mind to be present, train your mind to be grateful. Like, really, your happiness will be a lot more about that than it will be what you accomplish. It's funny to think about that, isn't it? Just the training. But it's this thing where knowing that most of the time you're not going to be that happy anyway, what are you really chasing? No, I just want the easy truth. I just want the easier truth. What are you really chasing? What's going to happen is the world's going to keep going up and down. It's not going to align to your delusions about what the world should be. That's going to perpetually frustrate you to no end, right? To no end, that's going to frustrate you. You know, maybe you learn social skills. Oh, now someone went home with you. Wee, it feels good for 20 minutes. Maybe you do it again, another 20 minutes, maybe an hour. Right, all that work. You know, maybe you make some money. Oh, you spent it. You guys know what happens. You guys know what happens. I've gone on million dollar spending sprees. What do you think happens? You look at some jacket you want, you size it up. I've spent 10K on jackets. Tens of thousands on jewelries, watches, things like that. You know, you go buy it. Oh, now I have it. You buy the jacket, drop down 10K, put it on, leave, you know, Tom Ford, Dolce, wherever you bought it. You walk out. What do you think you're thinking now? Next jacket. Yeah, the, the, the dopamine was all from the anticipation, right? Oh, there's that person that you really like, you're obsessing over them, you get them. They just find them annoying within a couple weeks, right? There's never actually any, like making happiness into your God is always going to fail. It's never going to actually get you what you want. You're perpetually going to be in frustration. So you've got to go deeper to derive real depth of satisfaction with life. You just got to go deeper on that, okay? So it's, it's in that process of deepening that you're going to find meaning in life, 
But again, the major reward being the gift of consciousness. That is really what I want to hammer in with you today, is that gift of consciousness. So let's bring that back full circle then. I've tried to lay out a two decade journey that I've taken myself. In my two decade journey, I've had a lot of things that if I'm talking to you like a baby, you'd think are cool, right? Oh, I was attached to over $100 million in sales. Oh, I competed with Hugh Hefner for best party in LA. Oh, I had a magical win-win experience with the many people that I met out. Oh, I became famous. I did travel. I go to spas. I live in a fat crib, right? So I can say that to you, right? Okay, cool. That's me talking to you like a baby, right? Because that's what you think that you want, okay? So that there, at a baby level, is basically what jumpstarts you into action. Because a lot of what I talked about here, when you're new, is not very compelling, okay? So let's think about this. What I talked about here, I'm trying to hammer you. I'm trying to show you the bigger picture. But if we were to bring that back around, what are some things that if you're newer to the journey, you might like right now? Maybe you'd like to make an extra $1,000 a month. Would that be cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thousand bucks a month, uh, more, yeah. right? It's what I would spend on average dinner, but thousand bucks a month. Cool, right? Maybe you'd like to see somebody you're very attracted to and have a nice relationship with them or whatever. That'd be cool. Maybe you'd like to be more popular. Maybe you'd like to have better parties. Maybe you'd like to travel to a city you've never been to. Who here has ever been to Hawaii? Put your hands up. Just a couple of you, right? How sad is that, that most of you have never been to Hawaii? You never had that experience. So these are basic level things that can jumpstart you out of a state of apathy, okay? So these are the kind of goals that you're initially shooting towards. You should be looking at things like improving your communication, like what we teach a lot here. How to raise your status, like what we talk a lot about here. You should be looking at things like how to make more money. If you guys remember yesterday's talk, we talked about how to make more money, remember that? We went pretty deep on that, how to find a crack in the dam, how to make more cash. You should be looking at things like figuring out what your purpose is and what you're here to do and what you're here to add to society. What are your skills? What are openings and areas that you could improve? You should be looking at things like inner growth, spiritual growth, how to get yourself to be more happy, to enjoy life more. Things like marketing and sales and how to do that. And things like becoming a connector or building lists and ways of doing that, getting more involved with social media, I think is a great way to find a crack in the dam. So we wanna begin by looking at that. That's where you start, right? Building better social skills, building skill sets when you're out at the club, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we wanna begin with that, maybe getting better at meditating. We want to begin with that. Then what you do is you find those areas and then that does what? What's that do? Gets you out of apathy. Okay, you're removed out of an apathetic state. Then as you begin to accrue wins in these areas, that is where you go on the journey that it is that I'm talking about here. You need mentors, you need peers, you need people who you're teaching, you need urgency, you need to be somebody who takes a lot of action, and you need somebody who is results oriented. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna see a range of wins that are up and down. Like I said, one day you're competing with Hugh Hefner for best party in LA, next day everything's falling apart, right? And you're learning through this process of iteration because you're trying things. And that would be what I would really encourage you to do is try more stuff, try more things, be more active, be more engaged, learn at higher levels, learn from higher people. And you're gonna see as you go along that things are gonna go up and down. And then you're gonna to wanna to preserve the ups. But over time, you're gonna realize that you can't preserve the ups. So then you're gonna dig deeper. And as you dig deeper in, you're gonna learn more lessons. And you're gonna learn more lessons. You're gonna learn more lessons. You're gonna learn more lessons. And again, it's that narrow road. By the end of this journey, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have transmuted that apathy and being stuck in a derp state to taking action and getting results but then what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a much, much deeper experience of the world. And so what you're gonna see is, you're gonna gain mastery on levels that you didn't even know that you could. 
Like you'll understand paradigms where you just do one little thing like boom like that and next thing you know 50 different things happen. Like for me with social skills, I got to the point where without even talking, I don't even need to talk. And I could do what most people would do talking. I just walk up, give a little look. And most people can't even understand that. People say to me, do you meditate? When, I'm, when I meditate, I don't really feel a big difference in my state than when I don't meditate. So, you know, things change actively. You know, I've done things like a simple video brings in over a million dollars for the business. Five, 10 minute video. Right now you see things like that and people say that's impossible. But these are things that happen as you grow in your power, right? It's like you're the Jedi and you're growing in your Jedi powers. So life just starts getting a lot more interesting as time goes on. But again, it's not just going to be the thrill of that that's gonna be the best part of it because that stuff is up and down. It's the awakening of consciousness that is the real gift. That is what you're gonna see from this, okay? And you're gonna see that awakening. If you go for it, if you, if you, if you go for it, your life's gonna be so different. Now, let me say the last thing on this point. The biggest thing that you have to do is you have to make a commitment that you're gonna to go to the end. That is the single biggest impediment that I saw over the years. You have to make a commitment that you're in this until the end, no matter what. You're in this until the end. So what that means is that when it gets hard, you're not gonna quit. No matter how hard things get, you're never, ever, 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 ever gonna quit. You're gonna find the resources no matter what. You're never, ever, 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 ever gonna quit. And the reason that you're not gonna quit is this, and here's the real truth that no one's gonna wanna tell you. You believe that you have something to lose. You're wrong. You don't, I will, I'm not gonna tell you how bad your situation is because it will scare you, okay? It will scare, you're not ready to hear how bad your situation is, in my personal view anyway. But let me just put it to you this way. You think you have something to lose, you don't. You are playing with nothing to lose at all, okay? You think you're alive now, you're not. You're, you think that you've been bored now, you haven't. You, like an animal that has to fight to survive, you have to fight and claw to be alive. You think you're alive now, you're not. You think you're awake now. You're all in this room thinking, oh, gift of consciousness, like what I have. You're wrong. You believe that, you're wrong. You think that you have something to lose, you don't. Rather, think about it like you have to earn your second birth, okay? You've had the birth of the body, but what you wanna be shooting for is the birth of the soul. And so if you haven't had that second birth, you've got whatever amount of time you've got to wake up. So you're thinking in your mind, you're looking at the mainstream and they don't think in these paradigms, and then you're seeing the massive volume of people in a limited paradigm not realizing that everything about the mainstream paradigm is largely trash. But when you see that degree of um, social proof, it's hard not to get pulled into their paradigms, their ways of thinking. Look, I do it too. Every low moment that I've ever had is when I got pulled into a paradigm like that. Well, I know an example. I'll give you an example. Hard example that would be like, you know I talk about people would stab you in the back? And I'd find myself mad at them as through the ego. They did this. I'm not gonna tolerate it when they did this. Just that egotism itself, okay, of doing that. Where do we get that paradigm from? Stupid ass Instagram memes. If they do this, then you gotta do this. That's all over Instagram, right? So I feel myself getting pulled into that. In reality, that's still a human being. What does it matter what they did? They're a human that's growing. It doesn't mean that you need to tolerate it or be around it, but why are you letting yourself get into a reactive relationship to it? Why are you letting yourself get upset? Why are you letting that bring you down? And most important, and this is the single most important, but you, none of y'all remember any of this. How is that, why are you allowing that to infect your capacity to have unconditional love? 
Now again, it doesn't sound very sexy or exciting, does it, right? But why are you allowing that to infect your capacity to have unconditional love? Now, does unconditional love mean you keep letting them just keep stabbing you? No, it doesn't. But if you're allowing that to distract your ability and your, your state of being for unconditional love, then you've let the satanic entertainment system get into your head and, and, you, and steal your will. So it's one of these things where you're going to get dragged back down, but you're, you're thinking that you have something to lose. You don't. Oh, what if I'm uncomfortable? What if it's too hard? You're not understanding what this place is. You're not understanding who you are. And you're not understanding the capacity of what you could be beyond all this. You're not understanding what the journey is. You're not understanding the function of the journey itself. You're seeing this at a surface level at very meat and potatoes. And that's actually okay if you want to reside as the focal point of your consciousness in the intelligence of the body. But if you do, how are you any different from a cow or a, le or, or a leaf? It's just biomass. That's all that you are is biomass. So there's other components in you and other potentials that you have um, that can be awakened in this process. And largely the awakening process occurs through pain. So you think that you're going for all these pleasurable things that you want, when largely what you really should be going for is to get into more challenge, right? To get into more things that you're aiming for pleasure, because you don't need to aim for pain. Pain's gonna find you. You could aim at pleasure all you want. Pain's gonna find you. You don't need to go, jet, you, know, you don't need to stab yourself. But, okay, it'll just happen to you. But the thing is, is that you have to understand that you've got to be actually aiming at things that are going to give you pain, right? Like when you lift a weight, you're deliberately lifting something because you want to feel that lactic acid in your arms. So you want to be shooting into things that have that potential to create and cause great pain for you, okay? And you're doing that specifically because that is going to allow you to grow. You don't grow through comfort. Everybody knows that, right? Think about that. We're all just shooting for comfort but we know that we don't grow through comfort. So what are you really, when you say I'm going for pure comfort or pure happiness, what are you actually going for? Settlement. It's just non-growth, right? Stagnation. But instead, what if what it was that you're going for was more towards non-dual awareness, right? In other words, what if what you're going for is the ability to create and manifest better situations of life, but also understanding that if there's pain on the way there, that you're actually able to stay present through that whole process that no matter what comes at you, it's not gonna get under your skin because now you're accessing a different dimension of yourself. You can't have an awakening generally through pleasure, 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 pleasure. I know this because I live in Hollywood. I see people that are making tons and tons of cash and people that are very successful socially and these are some of the darkest, most asleep people you'll ever see. The reason why this happens is because too much pleasure obfuscates uh, the ability to get present. Because if things are going too well, then what happens is that we attach on to the things that are going well, and then it removes any inclination that we'd have to tap into a transcendent state. It's only when things are that bad that we're likely to want to even take an interest in a transcendent state or to attach to a transcendent state. Without that basic standpoint, we don't really have a lot of interest to do that, do we? So, that's, so the journey is a, a mix of wins and losses. But what's most important is our awakening through that process. So it's like I said, the way that we break apart the apathy is we start looking at things in, in modern day, basic level stuff. This is very abstract. Let's go more meat and potatoes here. Basic level stuff. How do you make an extra thousand bucks a month? How do you build a list? How do you get better socially? How do you get a better dating life? How do you get more vitality? How do you get more mastery in a specific area? How do you become a better communicator? How do you build better social circles? How do you navigate modern society? Okay, so these are the things that you get mentors. These are the things that you wanna master. These are the things that you wanna really take on the project full on. Then what you do is once you've found other people that have the kind of results that you want and they have the kind of perspective that it is that you wanna learn from, you take on that knowledge, you go and apply it, and then what you do is on your journey itself, you actually grow through that process and you do what it is that you're here to do, okay? And that breaks apart the apathy, but to think that that is, you know, like basically like the ongoing jokes that me and a lot of my buddies have is the powers that be, they love the kind of Dave Portnoy type version of being successful. 
and he's a great guy, I'm not dissing him, I'm just saying that kind of mindset, because it's basically like, yo, I got the floor seats. You see that? Right, like, say, like people's version of a win is like floor seats at the basketball game. Right, like, yo, we're down at the front row. Like that, right? So in other words, they're still enslaved, right? Because the role of that person who's like, yo, we're in the front row, their, their role in the grand scheme of things is to, is to cause people to stay asleep. Same thing as celebrities, right? The role of celebrities is that if you spew the mainstream uh, garbage, right? If you spew back the mainstream rhetoric, you spew back the narrative, then you get super famous even if you don't have talent, right? That's why they pick people who don't have talent. They put a big list of people in front of them. They put a bunch of production quality on them and they basically make them famous. And the basic message is just say what we want you to say and maybe you could get super famous, right? And it, so it's the same kind of thing where it's like, and that's why they, they, they 99% of them have the same ideology. So it's, it's this basic, and that's a super deep point I just made that'll just fly over your head. It's a super deep point that'll fly over your head. That same thing of like, you know, if you're winning, you're like, yo, we got beer, yo. We're at the front row of the game, right? Not showing what the real importance is, which is freedom and which is the gift of consciousness. Freedom and the gift of consciousness is the ultimate gift. But as long as you're being distracted and you're stuck at that low-level paradigm, then you don't understand what that even is. You don't even have a context for that. And then you just want all this other stuff. But here's the other thing. Paradoxically, the only way that you're going to break apart the apathy is by actually going after some of those things, right? Like maybe going after like, you know, building a social media following or going after, you know, getting floor seats of the game, right? Because that's kind of the hamster cage that we're in. Because what's the other alternative? Like, just go right for freedom. Just go right for a gift of conscience, right? So you're like, okay. You see, it, it doesn't work like that. So, there, so you have to break apart that apathy with actually maximizing your skills, maximizing your abilities, maximizing your, your different skill sets, maximizing your effort, maximizing your willpower, learning how to hustle, learning how to focus your mind, all those things, right? So it's within this framework, okay, where I jokingly say it's like you're being spoken to like a baby, those are the things that get you started, and then it's the obstacles that you get within that journey, that's what takes you to the next level. What it, would, what it would have been for a prehistoric person was it would have been through hunting, right? It would have been through moving around. It would have been through the accruing resource and things like that. That's how they could have their awakening. But we have it in modern society. So we have to embrace that modern day enlightenment, that kind of thing that we're in. And again, if I had, if I had met a lot of people who did the more syrupy version of enlightenment, they just meditated their way there, and I was impressed by them, I would actually be following that path. I would give up everything right now, I'd follow that path. But I didn't see that. That's not what I saw, I didn't observe that. What I observed was that most of those people make comfort into their God. Uh, most of them will start doing psychedelics, most of them start doing drugs. So you'll see the same people that are like, oh yeah, I'm all like spiritual and stuff. Now let's eat the shrooms. Okay, now let's do acid. Okay, now let's do DMT. And, da -da. and they're doing that because Satan is their God. Right? Some of those psychedelics are actually not pleasant, but the point is, is that saves their God. And then those people are also often very easily rattled. They often don't have a super high degree of free associative thinking. Um, they are, they're often not as creative as they nearly think they are. They think they're becoming more creative. They think they're getting outside the box. They think they're seeing objective reality. They think they're seeing the one consciousness, yada, yada, yada. And that's not what I observed. I didn't see that. I saw the odd example of things like that to, to an extent, a couple of good examples. But largely what I saw is the people that really woke up were people that actually are gonna hustle, okay? They're gonna earn it. They're gonna go out, they're gonna earn their stripes. This is not the kind of thing that you just get given to you. This is not the kind of thing that you just stumble into. This is something that you go after with intention and it's a birthright that everybody has. True freedom, truly having that gift of consciousness, you have nothing to lose, you have everything to gain, and any belief that you have right now that you're getting out of this is flat out wrong, and you're gonna really suffer for that. So you can either take the call and go for it, or you can deny it, say it's too hard, go back in your comfort zone, and you're gonna be stuck, and you're gonna be made to suffer in ways that you can't even imagine. You're gonna suffer in ways that you can't even begin to imagine right now, in my experience. You don't just get out of this. You're gonna suffer either way. So you can either take conscious control of that suffering and use it as education and use it as a tool for awakening and use it as a tool to build competency and abilities and all these different cool things that you could do in life to broaden your life experience and make it really, really cool. Or you could just hide, okay? But either way, it's gonna happen, right? It's like, it's like do you wanna rip off the Band-Aid or do you wanna go, ow, 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 for like 90 years? <laughs> ow, 
Ow. Or do you want to go, F it. Ah! Right? And then you get the end result. So that's my main point, OK? Freedom, gift of consciousness, rip off the Band-Aid, understand what it is exactly and specifically that you're engaging with, and just let it rip. And this is the kind of thing that I think a lot of people at a higher level understand, but they're talking to me like a baby. Okay, and I said this yesterday, that people are talking to you like a baby. So I'm not going to be here and talk to you like a baby, although I am trying to translate it through your filter as much as I can, but I'm just going to talk to you as an adult. I'm going to assume that you can handle this, and I'm going to assume that you probably intuitively understand everything I'm saying. Like, I think most of you, as I'm saying it, you're like, this is probably what you're feeling. You're like, yep. 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 Yeah. 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 And it's just like, all right, fine. You know what I'm saying, right? It's like, you know, right? Like, I mean, you know, I don't think anybody should ever agree with 100% what anybody says, but I think largely what I'm saying here, you know, your, your gut BS meter and intuition is just like, yeah. All right. And so once you can kind of have that level of acceptance for what it is that you're facing, the mountain itself, then you can start to enjoy the climb. So that's really what it is that I'm trying to get through to you here is how to enjoy the climb. But I really believe that we only enjoy the climb when we know what it is that we're climbing. And so that's what I've tried to relate to you here today. You guys have fun in this little speech right here? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.